I'm Joanna Moffitt, Artistic Director of Core Productions. Thank you for joining us for this reading of Arrows and Apples by Christopher Kidder Mostrom. We are working to develop this play into a musical and you are here with us to experience the first step toward that goal, this reading of Arrows and Apples. The reading will help our composer along with our playwright decide which text to develop into libretto for the songs and then compose music for those songs. If you'd like to support projects like these, or this one in particular, please visit our website, coreproductions.org, to find out ways you can get involved. Stick around with us after the show for a talk back with the playwright, cast, and crew. And now, Arrows and Apples. Act 1. Prologue. A dim light rises on Pan as he sits on a log. He has the features that one might assume he would, that is, horns and furry goat legs. The log he sits on is quite large. He plays Pan pipes, oddly enough. After a moment he stops. The music continues despite his not playing. He plays again and the music stops. He pauses, and this time, when he starts up, the music does as well. He stands up as he finishes and speaks to the audience. A green leaf up there in that tree. Choose anyone, it doesn't matter which. A leaf on a tree is part of something bigger than itself. Something beautiful. Something powerful. Remove the leaf from the tree and it dies. Uh, the leaf, not the tree. Although, if you have enough leaves, the tree dies too. A tree is like a family community, a kingdom. One banished from the kingdom is considered dead to those within, but however, a kingdom which banishes too many, well, it dies from within. Isn't that a lovely little metaphor? Nice bit of symbolism there, huh? clever even. I spent a long time coming up with that. It's also academic though, isn't it? I mean, you're not here to listen to me blather on about trees. I mean, I am here in the forest. This is my home, my kingdom. It's what I know. The animals are mine, the trees too. I'm sure Artemis has her say sometimes when it comes to the animals, although her hunting is <laughs> and all that. But life is out here in the wild. That's all mine. Magical place, a forest, a place for the unexpected. Long live the duckies! <laughs> Didn't expect that, now did you? See what I mean? A place for the unexpected. There's a little bit of wilderness, go figure, out here in the wilderness. <laughs> now, I want to tell you why I'm here. I am Pan. Pan I am. If you haven't figured that out yet, well, and you probably missed some essential reading somewhere along the way. I am Pan, and this is an apple. And if you hadn't figured that out, I really don't know what to say to you. I am Pan. This is an apple. And uh, oddly enough, I'm here to tell you a story about an apple. Well, really three apples. Three apples and a girl, um, and a pig. Three apples and a girl and a pig and a race. And I imagine a bunch of other things that fit in there once I get rolling. It's a fine story, but every word of it is true. A man carrying a baby in his arms enters. He is King Iesus. He puts the baby behind the log. He stands over it a moment. Girl, you will die here. God, I begged you for a noble heir. You have punished me wrongly. I trusted you to give me a son. This is not the answer to my pleadings. This is a cruel joke. My queen dies giving birth, and now I have nothing at all. 
You killed my wife and my son, too, by giving me a daughter. She is not fit to be my heir and not fit to live. Die. Well, he's a little melodramatic, don't you think? I mean, I know it's, it's my story, but I could make him different if I wanted to, but it's kind of good to start with a straightforward villain. No gray area. Now, that fellow, that, that was King Easus, ruler of the great kingdom of Arcadia. Oh, hey, that brings me back to the tree, okay? The tree metaphor from earlier, I love it. This log that I'm sitting on, it is his kingdom. You know, tree equals kingdom, kingdom equals tree. Well, okay, so anyway, he brought his baby out here with the intent of her dying, but a bit of the wild stepped in. One of those chaotic little turns that can happen in the forest. This baby was not a leaf cast from the tree to die. No, no, she was a seed, an acorn. And she hadn't been banished. She'd been planted. End of prologue, act one, scene one, the Arcadian forest. The scene change between the prologue and this scene should take place in half light so the audience can see that the tree goes from its prone log position to an upright tree with branches and crown. Also, two or three other trees appear in order to represent the forest. This change is underscored by the sounds of Pan's pipes. The baby is still on stage where Iasus left it. As the lights come up, the sound of the forest replaces those of the pipes. Artemis and Aphrodite enter together. They are dressed as one might assume Greek goddesses to appear, i.e. robes, chitons, etc. They approach the baby. The child into these woods. Poor thing wouldn't have a chance out here by itself. Herself. Oh, baby girl. That's why I'm here. She needs a protector if she's going to survive. She's a princess, isn't she? You're trying to prove something again, aren't you? Some king asked for a son, and you had to intervene, right? Not exactly. The king of Arcadia paid tribute to Zeus and asked for an heir worthy of his kingdom, one that was wise and could rule over the Arcadian forest and who would be strong enough to conquer any foes. Zeus gave him all of that. Of course, the king thought he was going to be getting a son, but... You convinced your father that a girl could fill all of those requirements. And then some. But not just any girl, mm. though I'm sure anyone would do. No, this one is mine. I'll call her Atalanta. That was the name her mother planned for a girl, and she will still be all that her father asked for. He just won't know it for a while. Nice foreshadowing, huh? <laughs> so, the goddess Artemis and Aphrodite discovered the youth that had been abandoned in the Arcadian forest. I guess you already knew that bit already, though, right, huh? So, I, I guess that makes my appearance here a little bit redundant. No need to tell you something that you already know. <laughs> I'll tell you something you probably don't know, then. The praying mantis has only one ear. Isn't that great? That's just great. You, with a child, you don't know the first thing about bringing up a kid. I'll be just fine. If you say so. But what about your duties as a goddess? You can't seriously think that you are going to be able to raise a mortal child and do everything else you're supposed to do. I will. Little Atalanta isn't another Heracles, you know. She can't go back and forth between the lands of the gods and the mortals. She can't travel with you while you go riding in your chariot across the sky. You won't be able to leave her every time you need to assist a hunter to trying to find game or make the moon rise in the night sky. A baby needs constant attention and care. You have to be there by its side. I'll find a way to make it all work out. Well, Artemis, if you're going to be stubborn about this, at least let me give you something to make it easier to you. I don't need your help. I am a goddess in my own right. However, if you want to bestow a gift on Atalanta, then feel free. I'll accept whatever blessing you give her in place of one that you give to me. So be it. After a moment of thought, Aphrodite, goddess of love and queen of beauty, bestowed her gift upon the babe. Princess Atalanta, I cannot give you the mother that you need in your childhood. And I cannot promise that you will be best behaved or 
most well-mannered young lady, or even that you'll be able to relate to others of your kind, given who will be bringing you up. So you're going to have a couple strikes against you from the beginning. And so I'll give you the one thing that often can surpass other failings in most men's eyes. I give you the gift of beauty. I give you more beauty than I have ever given to another mortal. I give you enough that some of it must go into your heart as well as your skin. Good luck to you, my child. You're going to need it. And so Artemis found herself alone in the woods with a mortal girl child. My little princess, you don't know how lucky you are. Not every little girl gets to be raised by a goddess. I'll teach you everything I know. Your father did you a huge favor by leaving you out here. So what do you want to do? Not very talkative, are you? Not that I expected you to be. Can you tell who I am? Do you know that I'm a friendly face? Your face is friendly. You look happy. Hopefully that means that you are. I'm not sure though. I'm not really sure of anything when it comes to you. I know what I'd like you to end up like. I know that you have the potential. I know your, what your destiny is. But Aphrodite was right. I don't know how to be a mother, but I bet that most of the girls that she blessed with their first child don't know the first thing about it either. Now, it just so happens that another god was wandering around the woods that day, something he tends to do from time to time as he goes about his godly chores. <laughs> hey, Artemis! Leave me alone, goat boy. Now, now, didn't your pappy ever tell you it's not nice to poke fun at other people for things they can't control? Hey, what do, you, what do you got there? This is the new princess of Arcadia. Her name is Atalanta. Uh-huh. Now, uh, I don't want this to sound like a dumb question, but um, what are you doing with her out here in the forest? Saving her. <laughs> Cast off by an unhappy father. Eh? All right, so you're on some sort of mission to make sure she doesn't die. And that's, that's good, I guess. But if this little girl was put out here by the king of Arcadia, then who are you going to get to take care of her? I mean, you can't take her back into town. She'll be killed if she's discovered and she can't go. To I'm going to take care of her. <laughs> really? You. Either you're joking or I'm drunk. You don't look like you're joking. I'm just, hold on. Oh, God. Oh. Nope. I am not drunk. There is nothing but apple juice in there. I'm not drunk and you're not joking. Something is not right here. That poor child. Either stop joking around or go away, Pan. I'm not in the mood for you right now. All right. All right. Pan. Uh, what? Wait. I need your help. <laughs> no, I, I think you've got the wrong guy. I, I'm not up for the job, you know? I got a lot of trees to tend to, a lot of parties to throw, not to mention a lot of fillies to chase, you know? I like to try to keep busy, you know? Kid would really cramp up my style. You idiot, I don't want you to take care of her. Well, why not? Don't you think I'm good enough? Well, that's not exactly what I'm saying. But now that you mention it, no. I don't think you're up to the task of raising this special child. <laughs> that's good. That's a relief. Pan, I'm not joking. Well, I'm not either. I can't help you. I, and you don't want me to anyway. So if you don't mind, I've been drinking an awful lot of apple juice recently. And I need to answer the call of the wild, if you know what I mean. Help me, Pan. I'm not a mother. I don't know how to be or how to learn. Watch the animals. I watch animals all the time. I'm a huntress, am I not? Uh, it, yeah, but you don't watch them for the right things. You, you watch a deer to see if it's in range, if it's the weakest in the herd, if it would make a worthy prize for our favorite hunter. No, you right before you eat them. Mothering comes naturally to them in distinct. Especially 
especially the ones with fur and feathers. Now, I don't recommend why parents seem to have done that already. Take a hint from the wolf or, um, or the eagle. They have instincts that guide them. They're great mothers. Or better yet, watch the she bear. There is no better mother. She is loving and caring to her young and protects them ferociously. Go find yourself a she bear, honey. Take notes and copy her. That's the best help I can give you. Thank you. Wait, Pam, you gave me help, but can you help Atalanta too? Aphrodite gave her a blessing. Could you? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Little princess, so long as you are within the realms of the wooded lands of Arcadia, no wild creature will ever hurt you. I cannot promise the same for man. They may be able to harm you as they do to each other all the time, and I can't protect you from harming yourself. But I promise that if it lives on the ground or in the trees, it will not threaten your life. Well, that should do it. <laughs> I'm out of here. There's a cute little shepherd's daughter in the glade not too far from here, and uh, I'm off to pay her a visit to tend her wool. Good luck with the kid. Well, little one, now what? I guess I'd better find a mama bear somewhere. End of scene. Act 1, scene 2, in front of a large cave. Six years later, the forest of the prior scene is shrouded in fog and disappears as a large opening in the side of a hill becomes apparent. The large tree still stands on stage, but has moved locations to be away from the mouth of the cave. Its trunk is covered in moss, lichen, and fungi, and the crown of the tree is looking sickly. At rise, the stage is in darkness or blue light. It is nighttime. When Pan enters, he is lighted by a spotlight. I hate the one who says, I told you so. So I'm going to let Aphrodite be the one who does it. Aphrodite! I told you so. <laughs> it was only a matter of time until it happened. Only a matter of time. Those of us who hang out over at Mount Olympus started seeing Artemis less and less as she spent more and more time with this young Atalanta. It's the same old tune. Working single mother cuts back on social life due to lack of time. Problem is that Artemis didn't quite realize what she was getting into. I mean, it is bad enough that she missed the occasional bridge game with the girls, although Demeter was thrilled since she got to sit in as Hera's new partner. But worse than that, she never showed up for the gods versus goddesses annual flag football game. I mean, Anyway, sure, like she misses a social event here and there. And really it was no big deal. Well, to anyone but Hera, you see, Demeter is absolutely horrible at bridge. But never mind that. Anyway, where was I? Um, oh yeah, okay. So you see, it's dark out here. Not a big surprise, I guess. I mean, it's the middle of night. But when you take into account that there's supposed to be this full moon tonight. Well, you can see the problem. Artemis was such a devoted mother to Atalanta that she was neglecting most of her duties. It was just as Aphrodite had feared. I told you so. <laughs> All right, your turn is over now. Thanks for playing. Unfortunately, at last year's summer picnic, Artemis was there, and it was on that day that she offhandedly mentioned that it was I who suggested that she use the methods of a mother bear to raise the young princess. And so by order of Zeus, I find myself here to talk some sense into the queen of the hunt and the mistress of the night. The lights have come up to full. It is now daytime. Pan approaches the cave. As he does, a bear comes out and roars at him and threatens with his claws. Now that's funny. I know every creature that lives in these woods. I am the shepherd to them all. I watch each from its birth till its final breath. And you know, I've never seen this bear before. Go away, goat boy. After six years, you'd think you'd have come up with something more clever to call me. I am not in the mood for your stupid antics, Pan. Well, you never are. But so long as we are on the subject of stupid antics, why transform yourself into a bear? What do you mean? 
I've been living this way for the past six years because you suggested it. Um, not exactly. You said I should watch the she-bear and imitate the way that she raised her cubs. Mm. That's what I did. I intimidated her in every way. And I must say that I'm a very good mother after all. And it's all thanks to you. Aphrodite must be beside herself just knowing that I could do this without her. Yeah, Artemis, that's great. I'm glad I could be of help. Say, where is the little tyke? Out hunting. What? You said a six-year-old out hunting? Are you nuts? She bears teach their cubs to hunt by the time they're one-year-old. Besides, she had the dogs with her. She'll, she'll be fine. She's not a little girl, not a bear, Artemis. She was barely able to walk at a year old. I took that into account. She was always a little behind, but I knew that she could do it if she really tried. You are crazy. It is not safe for her to be out there alone, even with the dogs. Thanks to your blessing, she's safe. None of the animals can hurt her. So she's the perfect hunter. Not to mention, she's really fast. Faster than a jackrabbit, smarter than a fox, and more beautiful than the swan. She's going to be a great woman one day, a real leader among men. Ooh, and that brings up a big point. Has Atalanta ever been among men? Or any other people for that matter? No, she's only with me or the other animals of the forest. I see. And um, has she ever seen you out of this bear form? Does she know that you're a goddess? Of course not. She knows me as her mother. Mother bear. The sound of dogs barking is heard off stage. Here she comes now. You'll see. She's a great girl. Artemis transforms back into bear form. The sounds of dogs continue off stage, but Atalanta comes on. She is six years old, but she is played by the same actress as when she was an adult. She carries a freshly killed rabbit in her mouth. She runs on all fours. When she arrives next to the gods, she sits on her haunches, but does not drop the rabbit. Hold on a minute! Don't move! Atalanta and Artemis freeze in place. Pan steps forward and addresses the heavens. Hey! Hey, Zeus! This isn't fun anymore! This has gone too far. Now, listen. Listen, I know. I know it's not entirely my fault, okay? Though, she got confused. She didn't quite get what I was saying. She thought that I meant that she actually had to be a bear. Yeah, okay, right, that, right. It's my fault that your daughter can't tell the difference between symbolism and literalism, but I, it's just a good thing that I didn't tell her that she should take her example from, you know, the buzzard, or uh, she'd be regurgitating carrion down the kid's throat. I mean, look, look over there. Look at what Artemis is doing to that little girl. She's turned her into a wild animal. I know there are bigger things at stake here, but I cannot let this happen. Reason with her. Oh man, you sent the wrong God. I, her duties aren't the only ones getting neglected right now. I am supposed to be running freely through the woods, chasing a nymph right now. And then at 1030, I've got to oversee the bringing in of the flocks. So like, let's get this done now. Send someone else who is good at arguing. Athena, Athena maybe. And I'll be on my way. Okay. All right. Yeah, see. Fine. Okay, fine. I'll do it. But you've got to be able to give me a hint at how I'm going to get through to Artemis. Okay. Because this really is not my bag. Okay. Lights come up on another section of the stage where Toxius and Plexippus are uh, sitting at a campfire. They are roasting something totally inedible over a fire, perhaps a boot. Plexippus has an arrow stuck in his arm. Now how is that going to help? Those two aren't even able to help themselves. Let me alone. Oh, I, I get it. Yo, Artemis, come over here. Artemis? I forgot to unfreeze them. Oh, clap on. <laughs> clap off. Hey, Artemis, come look at this. Do you know who these guys are? Why, they're two of the best hunters in all Greece. They are Toxius and Plexippus, brothers to Queen Alithia of Calden. Mm, best hunters in all Greece, really? Because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not getting that. What are they doing here? There. 
I'm not sure, but it is certainly not hunting. They're cooking a boot. Yes. They look so sick and weak. They haven't eaten a real meat in a long time. Toxius removes the arrow forcibly from Plexippus's arm and then comforts him apologetically. Plexippus is wounded. Has there been a war? Nope. No wars or battles or even a skirmish. Pan. Yeah, from the looks of it, I would say he's shot by his compatriot. Toxius? He never. But he did. It wasn't on purpose, though. It was an accident. That's ridiculous. Toxius has, has, ne- has never had archery accidents. He never misses his mark. Well, he's not so lucky now. Luck like that doesn't change. It's God-given. Trust me, I know. That's exactly the problem. You are implying that this is my fault? Is that what you're saying? No, no, I'm not saying anything. They're saying. Toxius and Plexippus stand up in unison and shout to the heavens. Artemis! Why why have have you you abandoned abandoned us? us? See? Yeah, well, while while you were raising Atalanta, the hunters of the world are growing progressively less effective. It was you who always ensured their success, and they're hopeless without you. The nights have grown darker and darker as the moon no longer rises, since you aren't there to pull it across the sky in your chariot. These two men aren't the only ones getting affected by your absence. All of Greece is getting hungry because their hunters can't hunt. They need help. They need their goddess back. They need to eat something other than their footwear. I think my job here is done. I'm going to take off so you can think about all this, okay? Doodaloo. Pan exits. Artemis stares at the hunters for a moment. She then goes to a log or stump and sits. After a moment, she calls Atalanta to her. Come here, little one. Atalanta approaches Artemis. She still carries a rabbit carcass in her mouth. Come here, little one. I have a lot of things that I need to tell you, and I don't really know how. First, know this. I'm very proud of you. I can't even begin to tell you how much. You are so good at so many things, and that's something you should be proud of, too. Do you know what pride is? Do you know what it is to have the surge of feeling in your heart that says you've done your best and it turned out right? You bring that feeling into my heart. I know I'm not the best parent out there. I even pretend to be a bear to be a better one. But this is the best I can do. I've done my best and you've turned out pretty well so far. You're just right for who Atalanta is. And that is good, but I'm not just right for who Artemis is. That's what I need to talk to you about. I'm not a bear. I'm not, and you aren't either. We've lived like this for the past few years, but that's just not what we are. You're a little girl, a human, just like those two over there. Well, not just like them, for they are men. Unfortunate men, but men just the same. You, on the other hand, are a girl. You will grow up to be a woman someday, and you will lead men like those. Those poor men. They are hunters, and yet they cannot hunt. They hunt for food from the wild. The wild where we live. Atalanta, take your kill to those two hunters. Drop it at their feet. It will be a gift to them. Then come back to me. Atalanta starts towards the hunters. She takes the rabbit to them and sets it at their feet. What child is this? What's this it brought to us? It's a rabbit. And it's fresh. Atalanta runs back to the side of Artemis, who in the meantime has transformed back into her goddess guise. That is to say, out of bear form. The two hunters take the rabbit and put it in a frying pan that magically appears from their gear. Praise Praise to Artemis! Artemis the 
messenger, the has, messenger brought has brought food. us food. You see, Atalanta, this is part of my job. I have to take care of many people, not just you. If I don't do my job, many people don't eat as they should. You just help two of them, but there are many more. And that is just part of my job. Oh, hey, <laughs> Jack reminds me. Um, you know that whole not making the moon rise thing? Yeah, well, that's done a real doozy on the tides. There are all sorts of angry sailors that are stranded just offshore. Uh, doo -doo -doo. That's just great. You see all sorts of people that I have to help on a daily basis. I haven't been doing too good of a job of that. I need to get back to my job back to who I really am. And you need to go now and be among those who are like you. But you are not only a child, you'll need a parental guidance in other worlds. A hunter would make a perfect parent. Lights come up on Toxius and Plexippus once more. They are giddy and playing with the rabbit carcass in a way that makes it appear to be dancing. But, um, not those two. Toxius and Plexippus dance their way off the stage with the rabbit leaving a horrible mess behind them. The good hunter comes along and notices the disaster area the others created and starts to clean up after them. But wait, this man, the good hunter of the wood, he would be a perfect father for you. He is a good man who cares for the forest and all the animals. He'll teach you, the, he'll teach you most of the things that I would have taught you and he'll do it in a way that other people understand. Unlike most other men, he is responsible and caring, and not entirely self-centered. Men are foolish creatures, Atalanta, and they will bring trouble most everywhere they go, but some of them are truly good, and this is one of them. Go to him now, and know that he will protect you as I have protected you. I will always be with you, though. Not as, not as I have been before. Just know that I'll always know when you need Atalanta starts to walk toward the good hunter. Atalanta, promise me that you'll seek out one of my shrines when you turn 16. You'll be a woman then, and I'll have much to tell you. Now go, meet your new father. Atalanta runs to give Artemis a hug. The girl then walks up to the good hunter and takes his hand. Well, hello there. You're a little girl. I don't see many little girls out here in the forest. None, really. Her name Do is Atalanta. Name? Her name is Atalanta. Atalanta. You seem to be a very special little girl, for nature itself knows your name. You look hungry. You should come with me. I'll get you some food. You are blessed, good hunter. May you live happily in all your days. Take care of my Atalanta. She is in your hands now. Come along. We'll have to get you some clothes, too. These aren't acceptable. You need something that will keep you warm. Keep the flies off you, at least. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Nothing. Hmm. Well... Maybe later. The good hunter leads Atalanta off into the woods. End of scene. Act 1, Scene 3, The Good Hunter's Cabin. Years later. The stage contains both the interior and the exterior of the good hunter's abode. Inside, there is a hearth, a table, and two stools. A shelf or chest should be present as well for storing random things needed during the scene. Outside is the tree, now moved far from its original position. It has no leaves. It appears to be dead. An archery target is affixed to the side of the tree. Arrows stick out of the bullseye. Atalanta, now 16 years old, sits at the base of the tree, stringing her bow and re repairing her quiver. The good hunter is elsewhere at the moment. The stage is in half light while Pan enters, carrying a plunger. What 
a load of crap. Why do I always have to do the dirty work around here? Oh, sorry. Hello again. Do you have any idea how long it's been since we've seen one another? 10 years. Can you believe it? I know. Seems like only two minutes ago, but my how time flies. 10 years. I mean, a lot can change in 10 years. You, there are a lot of things you can do in 10 years. For instance, you can buy a savings bond and watch it mature in 10 years. You could get your bachelor's, your master's, and your PhD in 10 years. You can go from love me do to hey Jude to breaking up in 10 years. And of course, a little girl can grow up to be a young woman in 10 years. For a little Atlanta, the last 10 years were happy. A good hunter took care of her and what taught her to be a good huntress who was good at everything. Good, good, goody, good and good. Isn't it just nice that everyone is so good around here? Just about enough to make you good and sick, eh? Oh, so how's our little acorn doing? She's doing better than the tree she fell from. King Eassus' kingdom has fallen into ruin, and Atlanta, Atalanta is completely unaware of that fact. She's growing strong. She's well-grounded, and her roots are firm. She hasn't become so rigid that she can't bend and adapt as circumstances require, and she's started to spread her branches out, though not too far. She's beyond being the seed of another. She is now a young tree of her own. But there's a problem with that analogy, isn't there? I mean, I said a tree is supposed to be a kingdom and she's not a kingdom unto herself or anything like that. I mean, no, hold on. I, I gotta think for a minute. Oh, I got it now. Oh, wait, as you may know, in the heart of every tree is a spirit, a wood nymph. You may not be too familiar with them, but uh, I am very familiar with them, if you know what I mean. We all <laughs> know exactly what you mean, and it's truly tedious, goat boy. Again with the goat boy. What do you want? Rather than regaling the audience with ridiculous stories about you chasing after pixies, why don't you get to the point so we can press on? Yeah, all right. You want to see the best thing about being in control of the story? Watch this. <clears throat> and so Artemis flapped her arms up and down while snorting like a pig. Oh, this isn't funny, Pam. And then she kicked herself in the butt. Ah! Stop it, Pam. And so, as I was saying before, what was I saying before? Oh, never mind. I'll come up with something better in a bit. First, I've got to take care of something. After a moment, Artemis starts to spin. After a moment, Artemis starts to spin wildly and ran off the stage, all while shouting aloud the alphabet. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So anyway. I'll make it brief. 10 years in the wilderness has gone by pretty uneventfully and without much other human contact, but on this day... Pan exits as a good hunter enters in the company of Mieager. They walk towards Atalanta. We'd be very fortunate to have a hunter of your caliber join our hunt. Perhaps, my boy, but before we discuss it further, you must come inside, have something to eat. You've come a very long way. You should come and eat too, Atalanta. I didn't know you had a daughter. Most people don't. There aren't many people who will brave the paths this far into the woods. When I go into town, Atalanta normally stays behind to keep tabs on everything here. She is very beautiful. Thanks. I'm sorry, I should be talking to you, not your father, about you. Let me try again. Hello, I am Melieger, Prince of Caledon. My name is Atalanta. As I was saying before, you are very beautiful. And again, I'll thank you, but I hope that isn't the only thing you'll judge me on. Well, I'm looking forward to sampling your cooking at dinner too. 
I can always tell a good woman by her cooking. Well, since I do all the cooking around here, I hope you'll find me a good woman then. <laughs> I suppose that depends on what we're having. Uh, should we go in? Absolutely. The two men go inside the cabin. Aren't you joining us? In a minute. I've got to take down my target and put away my arrows. Your arrows? You mean that those are your set of shafts in that tree? That's right. <laughs> That's hard to believe. Why is that? Well, this is the good hunter's home, and that is his tree. It is my home as well, and a tree belongs to no one. The arrows do, though. They're mine. But every one of them is on the bullseye, and the good hunter is known throughout many kingdoms as the master archer. That is true, but he did not shoot that group of arrows. So you're saying that you're every bit as good as he is? Actually, she's better. Now get in here and eat, you two. I still can't believe it. A girl who is as good as a master archer, there is no way. Maybe we could arrange for a contest between us after we eat? <laughs> oh, impossible. I would never compete with a woman. It is below me to play a game like that. What? I won't lower myself to petty games to prove myself against a woman. Really? Well, Prince Milieger, you've proven that you're already lower than a worm. Of course, you couldn't lower yourself to compete with me because you can't get any lower than where you are right now. Wait a minute, you can't talk to me like that. I can, and I did. Now, go eat Papa's cooking and then go away. I have to put away my target practice stuff. I suggest you go in now before I decide that your heart is better for home for my arrows than that quiver is. I don't have to take this. I'm going to have dinner with your father. And when I am, a, when I am done, I expect an apology from you for this behavior. Mel Yeager joins the good hunter inside the cabin at the table. Lights go down on them, but remain up on the outside where Adelanta goes about taking her arrows out of the target and putting them in the quiver. After a few moments, she is joined on stage by Artemis. You're 16 now, and you've met a young man. Goddess, I am happy to see you, though I'm surprised that you came to me when I was going to be headed to your shrine in just a few days. I know that, but sometimes circumstances require faster intervention. What circumstances? That visitor in there. Prince Milieger. What about him? He can't be anything to worry about. He's here as Papa's friend. And even though I think he's a little too full of himself, a bit too puffed up over for his own prowess. No, no, not unlike all men. <laughs> no, that's not true. Papa isn't like that at all. No, you're right, little one. Papa isn't the only good man out there, is he? It's hard to say. All I know for sure is that it is the fate of all men who enter your life after you're 16 to meet with personal disaster. What do you mean? I mean that from here on out, you should avoid the company of men. They will cause you great pain, anguish, and sorrow. When you visited me before, you said that my fate was to lead men, to rise above others in battle and to be a champion like no other. You said I would be a princess and a queen. How is that possible without a prince? You are a princess already. That has nothing to do with possible. It is truth. And all the other things I've said are true too. You will be a champion. You will win prizes in battle and you will lead many men in your time. But those who get close to you or even those who just try to get close to you will meet with horrible ends. What are you talking about? I'm not a princess. I'm a huntress, daughter of the good hunter of Arcadia and devotee to Artemis. Those are the only titles that have ever been bestowed upon me. Well, Atalanta, this is why I said that we had to talk when you got to be 16. Why? So you could curse me when it comes to men and toy with me when it comes to the rest of my life? Atalanta, 
you have dedicated your life to me since you were a young child, younger than you even know. You have been special to me since the day you were born. And though sometimes the things I've told you in dreams over the years may have been confusing, I would never toy with you. A child seldom understands everything that their parent is trying to tell them. I don't expect you to get everything that I'm trying to show you right now, but I need you to listen and try to grasp what I have to say. I cannot alter what the fates have declared for you. I am a goddess, yes, and I will always help you with all things that I can, but the fates reign supreme on human lives. You do have a lot of leeway with their plans, however. You can do anything you want, really. Just know that sometime within your life, all the fates have decreed will come to pass. You can fight it as much as you want, but eventually you will lose to them. They will win and have their way. That's, that's not fair. Perhaps not. But it is true for every mortal. And just think, most people never even get a hint as to what their fate holds. You are a very lucky girl. You know what things have been foretold about your life. Now you can live your life in a way that will take no, that will take that knowledge and use it wisely. By avoiding men, for instance? That would be one way to use the knowledge that I've given you. You are a smart young woman. I'm sure that you'll figure out ways to make your life successful within the limits of your fate. They're not limits. Merely new challenges. I will not be limited by somebody else be their fates, furies, or the gods themselves. That's right, my Atalanta. Princess Atalanta. You haven't explained that yet. How am I a princess? I'm not going to explain. That will become clearer in time, at the right time. I'll trust you, goddess. Well, that's good. <sighs> that's all I got. So I'll bid you adieu as I head off. Take care of yourself, little one. Goodbye, goddess. I wonder if Prince Miliager is part of that curse that I bring on men. Artemis said that this would come to pass after I turned 16, but didn't say that it was true from the very first day that I turned 16. Perhaps it starts at some intermediate day during my 17th year. She did say from here on out, which would imply that she meant that from one moment when I had to be wary of meeting new men. Ellie Eager had entered my life prior to that chat, so he should be all right. After all, he doesn't deserve to die. He seems like a bit of a jerk, but he shouldn't die for it. What is this curse? Fates! Fates, come to me. I need your words to set me free. Oh crap, oh, oh, everybody freeze. Great. Terrific. All right, first, before we go any further, a word or two about the fates, okay? Just, just a second, okay, let, let me see. Let me see where it is, okay? Okay, yes, here it is, okay? The fates were the three who controlled the lives of men and women. They were three minor goddesses who wove the web of life. Their father was Zeus and their mother was Theseus. Themis. Well, that's all very academic, isn't it? Let me try to put this in a way that we can all fathom. The fates are sort of the overly successful version of Charlotte from the spider Charlotte's web. They spin a web with some message in it and the message inevitably comes true, and then they cut down that web, throw it away, and start on a new one. The only problem with that analogy is that the fates are less promotional and more controlling. <laughs> if Wilbur the pig had had them in his pen, he would have gone from some pig to some bacon in no time flat. They know everybody like a book, okay? But they already know the beginning, the middle, and the end of every story. Not much fun. That's probably why they took up knitting. If Atalanta is to have her questions answered, then the fates are the ladies to see. Now, 
there is something important for me to tell you. This evening we have an odd predicament. If you look at your program, you'll see that there is nobody listed to play the fates. Call it poor planning on our part. Sorry about that. Now, anyway, since I'm the storyteller, I have a couple of options. The first would be to play all three parts myself in an evocative and complex way that would be sure to impress with its intricately developed characters. But let's get real. I need help. So here's my second solution. Hand puppets. Pan takes a puppet out of his bag. He takes the stage. After a moment, he is joined by Artemis and Aphrodite, who both have puppets of their own. Pan's puppet has a pair of knitting needles, Aphrodite's has a tape measure, and Artemis's puppet has a pair of scissors or a big knife. All right, everybody ready? Okay. Oh, hey, that's my head. <sighs> Sorry about that. Fate, you have come to me. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Although, in truth, you look differently than what I would have expected. Aphrodite and Pan have their puppets at the ready, but Artemis does not. Her hand with puppet on it is still at her side. As Atalanta approaches, kneels and bows her head in respect, Artemis leaves the group in protest. I, I'm sorry, this is just um. Get back here! We have to do this! Just a few cryptic messages about, you know, like fat cows and stocks of corn and then we're out of here. Is this all just a joke to you? No, not at all. We have a job to do here. She called the fates. We give her the fates, okay? We all know how the prophecy goes. We can answer her question lickety split and then get back to the story, all right? Come on, Artemis, it'll be fun. Oh, sure, whatever you say, Barbie. That's not Barbie. This is Barbie. <sighs> Don't push it, go boy. You gave me the puppet with the weapon. That's enough, you two. We have a duty to uphold. And besides, have heart. That poor girl has been kneeling for an awfully long time. Fine. Shall we? Let's press on. The gods line up three abreast with their puppets and address Atalanta. <clears throat> Rise, girl! What is it that you want with us? I want answers. Purple! Or? Only if it's raining. These are all answers. We have spoken. Goodbye. Wait! I don't want just random answers. I want you to answer my questions about my fate. <sighs> She's one of those people. Lassius, you talk to her! No, she should start at the beginning like everyone else. She'll speak to Clothos. That's only natural. Well, girl, I am Clothos. These are my sisters, Laches and Atropos. And your name? I am Atalanta. Of Arcadia. Yes, yes, we know. Then you must know why I'm here. You are here to find out how you can beat your fate. Well, not exactly. Well, girl, then tell us. We haven't got a day. I have a problem. Oh, is it a big problem? Ooh, how big? Can I see it? I bet it's huge. Let me measure it. I can tell you how big it is. Am, am I doing all right? I don't know. It's a bit much. Well, what do you want? This tape measure is all I've got to work with. Listen, ladies, if you don't mind, it's fine, Aphrodite, okay? Just try to keep in mind what each of the fates are. Mine is Clothos, spinner of the thread of life. Yours is Laches, who judges the measure of a man. Yeah, that should be fun. Okay, I'm good with that. And Artemis is playing the role of Atropos, the cutter of the thread of life. She's the one who enforces fate and its grim end, okay? Are we all clear on that now? Now let's just keep that in mind as we go on. Let's press on. 
<laughs> Mortals who try to cheat fate are normally trying to cheat me. They are trying to cheat death. Why should I trust you, Atalanta? Well, because I'm looking for clarification rather than a way out of my fate. For by definition, fate is what will be and whatever will be, will be. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. I'm getting confused. Simple-minded bimbo. I am not a bimbo. Uh-huh. So, you want us to clear something for you? Yes, it's just a small misunderstanding. The prophecy isn't exactly clear. Well, no, of course not. It's prophecy. It wouldn't be any good if it were completely clear. But I have to know if it affects another person's life directly. So do most people's fates. Life is like a web. Threads intersect all the time. Your thread will touch many threads in your whole life. Okay, but what about Meliager? I met him after I was 16, but before I was told of my fate. Is he affected by my curse? Oh, dear. Good question. Uh, I say it's 50-50. Let's just flip a call. That doesn't seem right. There's got to be a better way than that. You're right, Latchius. What about his fate? We gave Meliager a destiny, too. I'll get the book. The book? Yes, we have a book where we keep all track of all the fates that we decree. You didn't think we could remember all that mumbo jumbo, did you? I guess not. Well, there you go. I remember some of them sometimes. The ones who really um measured up. <laughs> but when it really comes down to it, these there are really too many of you mortals to keep up here in the old um noggin. I see. I've got the book! Good! Now let's see it! The gods go into a huddle with their puppets' backs to At Atalanta. The book is held up so that it appears they are reading. After a moment and some mumbling about Melieger, the puppets all look at each other, do a take to the book, gasp, and return, oh. and return to their original line. So, what does it say? Uh, well, would you look at the time? Oh boy! <laughs> the puppets sprout wings and soar about in a holding pattern. They drop the book at Atalanta's feet. The gods and their respective puppets exit. Hey! You left your book! What? Millie Eager's page? Oh, I, I can't look at it. I, I can't. Of course you can! You didn't think we dropped it here on accident, did you? The fate of Miliager, Prince of Kowloon. Oh! That's a relief. End of scene. Act 1, scene 4 inside the good hunter's cabin. A few minutes later, the stage is set as before, but without the exterior showing. Meliager sits at the table. The good hunter, ladle in hand, refills Meliager's bowl with a large stew pot. Do More? Please. Uh, your daughter hasn't come in yet. No. She claims to be quite the archer. She is. She's naturally gifted in that and so many other ways. She'll make a good wife, then. She is very beautiful. She is beautiful. But I wouldn't count on her being anyone's wife, especially to someone who can't get past that first impression. There's much more to her than that. She's smart. She's athletic and wise. She's caring and competent at skills that confound many men. <laughs> I do not envy the man who thinks that she is a prize to be won or a woman to be tamed and ordered about. 
If there's one thing I know about Atalanta, it's that I didn't raise her to be anything less than everything she can be. The man who will win her heart will treat her as an equal. Equal to a man? I find it hard to believe that any man will allow a woman to be his complete equal. Sure, it's a nice idea that your mate would be your partner, but when it comes down to it, I wouldn't count on any man giving over part of that, the control of his home, farm, or kingdom over to a woman. Many women are already more powerful than their husbands. You finally find your way in from the woods to challenge the word of a prince? Hmm. And I would challenge the word of a king, too, were he to make the same claim. I dare say I challenge your father and claim his own wife as evidence against him. Now you are, you are questioning the integrity of my mother? Not at all. I'm just saying that she is a strong woman who holds the power of life and death in her hands, and her will is easily enforced in Calden, as is the king's. How would you know? The good hunter told me that you've never been outside this wood. You've never been into the heart of the kingdom of Arcadia, let alone across the border into my father's kingdom. I just know. It must have been something I read in a book. You could read? Only men are taught to read in Caledon. I imagine it is the same in the courts of Arcadia. It is. Papa taught me to read. And many other things that I wouldn't be able to do if I'd been in, born in Niasis, the tyrant's court. <laughs> be glad you weren't born into a royal family then, girl. You are truly lucky. A rare woman who can at least aspire to be equal to a man. There's one thing in which she is already equal to any man, and it would behoove you to notice it. It is she, and not I, that you ought to be asking to join your hunt. Hmm. Maybe I should. Perhaps you ought to tell me about the hunt first, so I'll know if it's something I'd even be interested in. All right. Well... As I was telling your father, Atalanta, I am here because I am organizing the hunt for the wild boar. You see, there is a giant wild boar terrorizing the people of my father's kingdom. It is destroying crops, killing livestock, and even has started to attack innocent farmers and their families. That's, that's horrible. It is. And many of our kingdom's best hunters have tried to get the boar but no one has been able to track it for more than a dozen yards. It's like the thing vanishes, disappears like a popping bubble whenever we get near it. And it reappears just as surprisingly somewhere else, just out of our range. It is a creature unlike any other. It sounds like there's some powerful magic behind that pig. Yeah. Have you seen the boar yourself? Only from afar, mostly. Mostly I know that I, what I know from what I've been told by my men and others who have seen it. I've been told all sorts of stories about the boar and it seems that most of them are true. Not all, but most. Some of the farmers have gotten caught up in the excitement around the whole situation and have started telling tales that have spread throughout the kingdom. What are they saying? Well, <laughs> I don't know how much truth there is to it, but one rumor against the farmers says that the boar is my father's fault. One of them went to the oracle at Delphi to try to find a way to be rid of the menace. And he came back saying that Artemis had sent the beast to punish my father for not honoring her with a festival this year. He didn't honor her. Not like he usually does. He had to cancel this year's ceremony due to floods, but he never rescheduled them. He said that the goddess could wait until next year. Your father's a fool. My father's a king. It doesn't matter if he is foolish. He decides what is done, and that is the way it is. 
Well, I wouldn't doubt that Artemis sent the boar. And if that's true, you're going to need me on your hunt. I can't believe that I'm going to ask you to join us. I came here to ask one of the greatest hunters of our time to join in the hunt, and I get this little girl instead. First, I am not a little girl. I am a woman. And second, you'll not only have the greatest hunter of our time with you, but the greatest of all time. Now, Atalanta. It's true, Papa, and you know it. It is true, Atalanta, but you must learn to be more modest. Men don't like women who are braggarts. It isn't becoming of a lady. Oh, I don't know. I like a woman who is confident. And Atalanta, you have confidence to spare. All right, you can join the hunt. And you, sir, will you join us? After all, it is your spear I was after when I came all the way to the forest. Oh, no, Prince Meliager. You'll have no need for me now that you have Annalata along. I'll stay here and wait for the good word that your beast has been defeated. Good luck to you. Be safe. You've never been outside these woods. The rest of the world is not the same for you. You are surely blessed, but some things are bound to change. You're entering a world where men won't expect much from a woman and will mistrust a woman who surpasses their expectations. Don't worry, Papa. No new men will be able to get near enough to do me harm. I will prove to be harder to catch than they'll ever guess. I will put my trust in only one man at a time. That is the way I've lived my life to this point. I've always trusted you, Papa. And now I will put my trust in the leader of my hunt. Meliager, come along. We will get your boar. Let's go hunting. Atalanta leaves through the front door and Meliager follows, somewhat confused as to when he lost control of the situation. The good hunter sits down at the table as Pan enters, with the fate's books in his hand. He has been reading from Meliager's page. Well, finally! You will n I knew my metaphor was solid. Sir, you are never going to guess what I found out in your yard. Go ahead, guess! From the looks of it, I'd say you found a book. Well, naturally, that was easy. But can you guess what book it is specifically? Now, I bet you can't guess that. It's the Book of the Fates. Okay, you're good. Okay. Tell me what page of the book I am um, specifically. I bet you can't guess that. 318. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> well, I'll be an easy goat. Well, you know, it's not a lot of fun playing guessing games with you. Just a talent of mine, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I got this feeling that I know you from somewhere. Well, it is your story. I imagine you know everyone and everything in it. <laughs> I suppose you must be right. It must be it. Anyway, it says here that Prince Meliager's fate is tied directly to a stick. And that's what I was talking about as I came in. You see, Meliager is a branch and is a branch from the tree that has come from the kingdom of Caledon. Now, if Meliager is a branch, then he isn't a seed, so he won't become his own kingdom, but he can be the strongest part of the kingdom. So yeah, the metaphor works. <laughs> Meliager is wood, and Atalanta is a wood nymph. Sounds like they go together pretty well. Hey, you're right. And you were listening, weren't you? Now, that is great. They'll be able to get together, and they'll live happily ever after. Husband and wife, prince and princess of Caledon. Well, the tree known as Caledon. That's got to be a better tree, a prettier tree than that Arcadia one. It is right now, yes, but wood burns and passions burn hot. Mm. And that is a clever allusion to what is here in that book. Very good. Wait a minute. How do you know what's in here? 
Who are you? Your daughter's coming back and I, I, I need to go. Papa, how could you let her go with that man? Stay, stay. It is my daughter, but it is an Atalanta. You have another daughter? Many, actually. Papa, how could you let her go with that man? Artemis? Papa? Zeus. That's right. <sighs> All right. Now that masquerade is done, can we get to the problem at hand? I don't see a problem. Atlanta is going out into the world of men. Yes, she is. And now she'll be able to accomplish the things that she was put on this planet for. Things that you talked me into allowing a woman to accomplish, I'll remind you. But that was before we knew her fate. Of course. She had to be born to have a fate. And her original fate was to die in these woods. You know as well as I that fate can be avoided, or at least postponed. You interfered, and she has yet to die here. She didn't starve as a babe. Pan interfered, and the animals can't even hurt her here. I interfered too. And it doesn't only have to be gods that interfere. Meliager has also had his fate altered by interference. How? He's supposed to die when some stick burns to ashes. That's right. And that stick was in the fire in his mother's room when she learned of that fate. Queen Althea pulled the stick out of the heart, kept it from burning, and put it away far from flames. She's guarded that stick with her life. Her interference has Meliager alive, and it will continue to do so. So that's a... Uh... That's just great and all. And can anyone tell me when I lost complete control of my own story? Shut, Shut up, up go, boy. go boy. Wow, that hurts. I expect that from her, but from you, Zeus? Wow. I'm going to be going now. But when I come back, this will be my story again. Fine, so. I will. Thank you, Pan, you may go now. Fine. <sighs> I thought he'd never go. I'm worried. Their fates are too vague. Fate falls in the realm of prophecy. It wouldn't be any good if it were completely clear. So I've heard. They're bright young people who can figure out ways to keep themselves out of trouble. Besides, Meliager seems to be the only man she can have in her life. So why not encourage it? I guess. You were a good papa. I tried to be. Aphrodite was impressed. And Hera even has some good things to say about you. Now that's a rarity. We should get back to our duties. I have a storm to create somewhere, I imagine. And some mortal's life to interfere with, no doubt. No doubt. End of Act One. Act 2, Scene 1, The Kingdom of Calydon. A week later, lights come up on Pan, revealing only his head and shoulders. He is dressed like one of the kids in Newsies, a hat and a vest, etc. He carries a bundle of newspapers under his arm and a single copy in his hand. Extra! Extra! Some pig! Board trashes three more farms. Extra, extra, read all about it. Prince Meliager puts together posse to show Hog who's boss. Extra, just two bits. Hey, you got two bits. Quarter gets you all the news that's fit to print about the Caledonian boar hunt. That's what they're calling it now. Really, that's what I'm calling it now. You see, I'm back in charge of this story. I'm a clever boy. Took me a little bit, but then I realized if I was gonna be in charge of how this tale was told, I'd have to do it through the presses. So here I am, and here you are, and here all these are. I've got a royal problem. I haven't sold one. I can't even give them away. I'm lugging them around is just like killing me. 
Anyway, like I was saying before, Prince Meliager was putting together a posse to hunt down the wild boar and kill it. You, of course, know that already because that's why he was at the good hunter's place to begin with. So we find ourselves a few days later back in the prince's homeland. He's not back yet. Atalanta is not here yet. And the rest of the posse is getting restless. Lights come up on Toxius and Plexippus, who sit on a set of stairs. In addition to the stairs, there are a couple of columns. This is where civilization and wilderness meet. There are trees as well. Additionally, there's one tree that is lighted to stand out from the rest. The tree that has heretofore represented the kingdom of Arcadia is not on stage, however. After a moment, Toxius checks the time, gets up, and walks around, pacing. Would you sit down? You're making me nervous. Where is your stupid nephew anyways? He's your nephew too, you know. Now, you might recognize these two from before. This is Toxius and Plexippus, Queen Althea's brothers and two of the best hunters in all of Greece. Now, while we are here among the trees, let's have this little lesson about Prince Meliager's family tree. Come this way. First, you'll be so proud of me. This tree is a part of my ongoing metaphor. This tree is the kingdom of Calydon. Now, I know it's a little small, but in truth, Calydon is a relatively new kingdom, so a younger tree is sort of appropriate, I think. Now, although this tree could be said to represent Meliager's family in some part, it is not his family tree. That's right here. On this scroll is described not only the history of the royal line of Meliager's father, but also the family history of his mother. And that's where we're really concerned about right now. Meliager's father has fallen sick over the past few years. This is really Queen Althea's kingdom now. She and her brothers run things behind the mask of the king. Queen Althea enjoys her power, but is looking forward to the day when her son can rise to his own greatness. Her brothers, on the other hand, have never liked Meliager. I've never liked that boy. Me either. In fact, they wish he'd never been born at all. We wish he'd never, we wish been, he'd never been born, born at all. all. All right, Pete and repeat. Cut it out, you two. I'm trying to tell the story, and this isn't going to go anywhere if you keep repeating everything I say. Look, Pen, we're, we're feeling a little left out of the action right now. Yeah, you just keep saying, and we just keep sitting. Well, I never. Oh, shut your mouth. You're right. Blah, just blah, blah, blah. Noise, noise, noise. What my brother is trying to say is that we'd appreciate it if the narration took a break and let the story proceed unaccompanied by extraneous commentary. Because I've got stuff I want to say too, you know, important stuff, stuff with meaning, you know? Uh Uh-huh. Listen, Pam, let me put it this way. You can take a long needed break and for your trouble, I'll buy all your papers there, okay? Really? Yeah, how much you want? Uh, I'll give you 10 bucks for the whole stack. 20. Uh, 10. 20. Fine. And, and you'll go away then? Until I have my say, right? The two of you will not see me again. I promise. We won't see you again? That's right. So long as you, Toxius, and you, Plexippus, are on this stage, I will stay away. All right. I will not come back until the two of you are done. Not until you are completely finished. Okay, okay. Well, enough chatter. We get the point. You can go now. Can I just have a moment to say goodbye to all the good folks here? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, alone, maybe. This is, this is sort of a hard thing for me. All right. Plexippus? Oh, cool. Okay, so the great thing about this is that we're all of us over at Mount Olympus had agreed that we were going to stop interfering with this story for a while anyway. So I was planning on leaving for a while. (laughs) And I got an extra 10 bucks out of it. 20. 20. Um, That's right. Ha! Mm. I think you got all the info that I had for you. Uh, Wait, wait, just a second here. Let me see. Um... Yeah, these two are Queen Althea's brothers. We got that. 
They don't like Melly Yeager. Got that clear. They're always part of the hunting party. Uh, Queen Althea always carries the stick with her. Uh, and Melly Yeager and Atalanta are on their way back right now. <laughs> I mean, that's about it. So I'll be back after a while, but not until these two are gone. Shouldn't be too long. All right. Pan exits, leaving the stack of newspapers behind. After a moment, Queen Althea enters, carrying a small ornate box which she never sets down. She walks to her brothers, who still face away from the audience. She looks at them for a moment and then shouts. Oh! You can't scare us. We're on our guard. We're alert and wary. Yeah, well... I'll get you someday. Maybe, sister, but I doubt it. Hush now. I'm trying to hear if the boy is near. I must speak. I have good news, my brothers. My son will be returning soon with other hunters to help rid our kingdom of the curse that has been put upon us. What makes you think that Meliagor can succeed where others could not? You, you mean where you and your pitiful brother could not succeed? Not just us, you know. Twenty others, to be exact, and only seven of them came back. At least we lived to tell about it. Yeah, sure. Always looking out for yourself, that's nice. Now my son has to risk his life to save the people. I, I just hope you are aware of how disappointed I am in you. Our mother would be ashamed if she were still here. I'm glad she's not. How dare you say that? Plexippus of Caledon. Don't you know what our mother went through to give you everything you had? You need to show some respect for our mother, the same respect that you show for me. I take care of you now, don't I? You sure do, Althea. Well, there you go. I'm going to send the two of you on the next hunt with Meliager and the rest of his group. You will be a great help to him. He's trying to get the best hunters from around all of Greece to help, and since the two of you are the best hunters that our kingdom has to offer, you should be there among that compliment. We won't let you down, sister. With the help of the prince and any other great hunters that he brings, we'll no doubt get the wild boar. After all, are not Plexippus and I the favorites of Artemis, goddess of the hunt? I've heard that to be true, but it would be nice to see it proven on this particular hunt. Do me proud and bring back the hide and the tusks. I'm just afraid that my husband's affront on the honor of the goddess far outweighs her favor for you. But we shall see. If all her favorites from across the land unite to defeat this monster and cannot, then we will know that the king has doomed our kingdom completely. I just have to hope that this is not the case. The skill you possess with a spear, Toxius, is unrivaled, and the way that Plexippus shoots his bow is compared to no one. Mother, I have returned. Uncles, I bring with me one who is said to surpass even the good hunter of Arcadia in all skill. What? Couldn't you find the good hunter himself? Toxius. You know that the good hunter isn't real. He's made up. You told me so. He is very real, Plexippus. And he said with me, a hunter who he says is better than he is. Hello. <laughs> a woman? Now I know there's no good hunter. Oh, he was joking. <laughs> oh, good joke, Milliger. This is Atalanta of Arcadia. I don't think he's joking, Plexippus. Nor do I. Atalanta, huh? How old are you, girl? I have lived 16 years. Pray tell, who is your father? I was raised by the good hunter of Arcadia, but I've never known my real father. I see. So you believe yourself a good enough hunter to be on a hunt with men? I do. But Althea, she's a girl. And it doesn't bother you at all that it is considered bad luck to have a woman in a hunting party? No. It won't be considered bad luck any longer after we are successful. You are a confident young woman, Atalanta. 
You dare to tempt fate. No more than any other woman might. No more than you might yourself in the right circumstances. Nice box, your highness. Yes. Thank you. I like her. She's got spunk. <laughs> I'm taking the good hunter's word on her archery skills. But I can vouch for her tracking and orienteering skills myself. It was with her guidance that got us here so quickly. We'd still be out in the marsh somewhere if I were the one who led us back. And her speed will one day be legendary. I must say that I don't think I've ever met a man who can run that fast. Well, it sounds as if you've got my boy smitten. Let's hope his faith in your skills is motivated by true observation and not by his seeming affection for you. I am apt to follow his recommendation. If Meliager says that you should be on the hunt, then it will be so. She should. Ugh, I'm not hunting the woman. Yes, you are. And you answer to one. And don't forget it. Yes, Althea. Toxius? Yes, Althea. Atalanta, there is a secret that I will want to share with you after the hunt. Something that I think I know about your lineage. Why can't you tell me now? Patience, girl. After the hunt. I hate that. I hate that! Huh? Uh, what? You go first. That's the second time that's happened to me recently. Other people know more about who I am than I do. Why won't they won't just be up front and just tell me? People very seldom say what they mean. Illusions and similes abound, and the gods are worse. They talk in riddles, crave metaphor and fuse symbolism. I agree wholeheartedly that we'd all be better off if we just talk to one another plainly. So what is it that you hate? <laughs> I hate it that mother assumes that I make decisions based on my passions rather than as someone who can think. I choose to support you and promote your being part of the hunt. So clearly I must be in love with you. It makes me sick. So what if you're a woman? If you're half as good as you and the good hunter claim, then you'll be a big help on this hunt. Atalanta, I need you to know though, that most of the hunters that have gone after this beast have been killed. If you would choose to back out of the hunt, I'll understand. I won't back out on you, Billy Eager. You need me. I'm happy to hear that. Let's go get ready for the hunt. Tomorrow will be a big day. End of scene. Act 2. Scene 2. The Kingdom of Calydon. The next day. The stage is set the same as before. The hunting party has assembled. Atalanta and Plexippus carry bows and quivers, while Meliager and Toxius have spears. They are all listening to Queen Althea as the lights come up. And so, this pig must die. To the hero or heroine who dispatches the beast go the pelt and the tusks. These trophies are fitting of a true champion. Now go, make our kingdom proud. So, where do we start? The boar hasn't been through here in days. We should start near the farm it attacked yesterday for better tracks. The boar will be here shortly. Atlanta's prediction didn't, Atalanta's prediction didn't sit well with the men who saw themselves as the best hunters and trackers of all of Greece. And in truth, they once had been. But I admit they f their favor had worn from them as Atalanta grew older. She never wavered in her honoring me. And on the day of the hunt, I was determined to make it easier for her than the others. But I couldn't make it too easy or they'd all suspect divine intervention. And as you know, 
We won't promise to keep out of the story for a while. Hello. Now, by now, you may have noticed that Melly Yeager and Ad Atalanta have been demonstrating a bit of attraction for each other. Problem is, it isn't moving along the way I wanted to. So, if you promise not to tell the other gods, I'll try to fix the situation right now. By my touch, you, Melieger, shall love deeply the next woman you see. All right. Well, that probably takes care of it. Now, remember, not a word to the other gods. We aren't interfering with these guys right now, you know. Well, <laughs> what's the hold up? Get going, hunters. Atalanta. Let's get that pig. Let's get that pig. The hunting party runs off stage together. In the meantime, the wild boar comes on stage. It is either a person in a costume or a large puppet, perhaps operated by Artemis and the good hunter. Queen Althea sees the boar and screams. It's here! It's here! The wild boar is here! It's over here! Let's get it! The entire hunting party runs on stage. The wild boar sees them coming, squeals, and runs off stage quickly. The hunting party chases it off stage. After a moment, the wild boar runs across the stage with the hunting party in pursuit. But prior to making it off stage again, it turns and stands its ground. The hunting party sees that they are running into the tusk end of an unfriendly wild boar. The hunting party turns and runs, shouting for help. Sounds of fighting against a giant pig are heard off stage. The good hunter sneaks on stage. He has a rope with a loop in it. He sets a snare from a tree and addresses the audience. It is important that you see that I am not interfering with the story in any way. I am merely placing this lovely rope in this lovely tree. As you can hear, the hunt isn't even near here right now. Of course, if the boar ends up coming this way and accidentally gets itself caught, there's nothing I can do since I won't be anywhere nearby. And if anyone asks, I wasn't ever anywhere nearby. Got it? Good Hunter exits. Toxius and Plexibus run on stage as if their lives depend on it. They take a moment to rest. I think we lost it, Toxius. Be quiet, you fool. I might hear you. A squeal is heard approaching from off stage. Help! The wild boar runs on stage in hot pursuit of the two brothers, only to get caught in the snare. Atalanta approaches it, shoots her bow. The wild boar is hit. It runs around in wild agony. Atalanta is joined by Melieger. The two of them grab the end of the rope that trails behind the wild boar. Once they secure the beast, Melieger kills the boar with his spear. You did it! Melieger has slain the beast. <laughs> the hunt is done. We have won. <laughs> I couldn't have done it without Adelana's help. After all, she was the first one to hit the beast. She wounded it and made it weak enough for us to catch it. You're the champion, though, Melieger. You hit the hide and the tusks. <laughs> you are a worthy champion. Toxius goes to the beast and plucks the tusks from its head. He presents them to Melieger. Plexippus goes to the wild boar's carcass and with a flick of his wrist, pulls the entire hide off. He also gives this to Melieger. Glad you got it, Melieger. The prince has done his country good! Maybe, but I owe my success to this woman. Atalanta, you are my strength today. Please, accept these trophies as my thanks. Hey! What are you doing? I am giving these to Atalanta. Uh, over my dead body. Plexippus steps between Melieger and At Atalanta. Stand aside, Plexippus. I earned these trophies, and it is my right to give them to whomever I choose. 
They are yours to do with as you see fit, Maliego, but I'd recommend giving them to another man. Don't be weak. If you give them to her, you'll be insulting the work of all the hunters who have died in pursuit of this fine beast. Yeah! Toxius and I fought the wild boar twice. We should get the trophy before she does. I want the tusks myself. You can have the pelt, Toxius. It would make a nice blanket. No, I want the tusks. No, but... We can work that out later. Give them to us, Meliager, not to the woman. Toxius joins Plexippus between Meliager and Atalanta. The woman has a name, Uncle. Call her Atalanta. Show her the respect she deserves. She saved your life. She had not hit the creature. It would have caught you and added you to its list of victims. Giving the trophies to her would honor all those dead hunters far more than giving them to a couple of frightened rabbits like the two of you. What? You ran away like a couple of mice, hiding from the big nasty cat. You call yourselves hunters. Why, you? Aphrodite runs on stage from one direction. Artemis runs on from another. They both clap their hands twice, and the action freezes. Normally I'm up for a good fight, but this is a special case. And I'm more of a lover than a fighter. Right. Anyways, um, this is where the story gets a little messy. Under normal circumstances, we would let Pan take care of this, but since he's off spending the spoils of his ill-gotten gains, you know, the bribe he took from those guys to stay off the stage. Right. Okay, so... Let's get this unpleasantness behind us as we as quickly as we can. I'll tell you the basic gist of what's going to go down, what's gone down, and Artemis will go get his, her puppet. Right. Wait. What? I need you to be a tropos for this just a second. Oh, right. Artemis grabs her puppet from off stage. Ready. So, Toxius and Meliager had a fight. Toxius lost. Plexippus and Meliager had a fight. Plexippus lost. Queen Althea freaked out. I mean, freaked out. Next thing you know, she's burning the stick. You know, the one that she is, that is keeping her son alive against all odds. Anyway, that's no good for Meliager. And so in the end, even the queen lost. But the fates win in the end. <laughs> well, that uh, pretty much sums it up. So I guess we'll get back to our regularly scheduled story. No! You, take the girl away. Get her out of my sight and out of my kingdom. Don't l ever let her come back. We should go now. We'll talk on the way. Yes. There's nothing left here. No. This isn't your fault. Atalanta says nothing. The two of them leave the scene. The bodies of Meliager, Toxius, and Plexippus still lay on the stage as Pan enters. Hello again. You didn't believe it? All the gods promise not to interfere, and I am the only one who doesn't. That is not the normal way of things around here. <laughs> Ew. Well, that's not good at all. But... I didn't come back until their part was done, just like I said. I gave my word and I kept to it. Sad, really. He bought all those papers and he never had the sense to read them. The whole story of the Caledonian boar hunt is in there. All the news that's fit to print. I even told him that. Had any of them read it, they might not be in their present state. Oh well, I guess the fates got their due. Had to happen sometime. Fate is catching up with Atalanta, too. This starts us down the road that was predicted. One man's end is merely another man's warning. Oh, men, beware of Atalanta, for those who get close to her will suffer great tragedy. End of scene. Act two. Scene 3, The Royal Court of Arcadia. A few days later, 
The lights come up on Pan sitting on the log from earlier in the play. It has fallen in the back of, to the position it was in at the very top of the show. The tree is dead. Pan plays his pipes. The song is a sad one, full of pain and remorse. Pan never says a word this time. His song continues as lights rise on Atalanta, who is draped over the log in tears. She wears the garb of a princess and a crown. Once his song is done, Pan gets up and leaves the stage. Fates, you have cursed me. The one man in the world who was supposed to be safe for me to love is dead because of me. You lied to me. Your book lied. Millie Ager was not tied to my fate. He wasn't supposed to die because of me, but no. He gets close to me and he dies. Now what? Am I supposed to go through life on the animals have their mates. The trees gather together. A lone oak may stand by itself against the weather. But most trees, lumps, woods, forests. I do not want to be a lone oak. His fate was tied to that stick. Why didn't you tell me that the stick would get burned because of me? Artemis! Have you abandoned me? You protected me, kept me from the influence of corrupt men, and now I am living in the court of Isis the tyrant. And what's worse, I find out that he's my father. My father! You said I'd find out why I was a princess at the right time, but what's so right about it? Everything is wrong. Queen Oak said she knew my lineage. How many other people know about the left one side and the horns die? How many more know more about who I am than I should? I we were together. Killed him. I killed him. I will not go for any man again. I can't. I won't. Princess Atalanta, the king requests your company. Leave me alone. Oh, I beg your pardon, princess. May I tell the king that you are coming presently? Tell him whatever you want to. I'll be there when I'm good and ready. Yes, your highness. Quit calling me that. Quit calling me that. Can't someone just call me Atalanta? Call me anything other than princess. Quite hard on yourself, little one. Call me little one again. Just this once, little one. Thank you. I'm here with some news. I'm not sure I like it when you bring me news directly. I think to tell Malager that you like it better when people speak to each other directly without metaphor or simile. Well, yes. When you used to tell me things in dreams, it was harmless. You tell me things directly. It's not good. Would you prefer to decipher your news? I prefer to not hear it at all if it isn't good. Can't you just live life without hearing it first? Knowledge is the only gift that I can still give you, little one. You've given me enough, goddess. Please. No more. If that is your wish, then I will say goodbye. For now, just remember as you go on to think fast and run fast, then you should be all right. Goodbye, goddess. 
I suppose I should go and see what my father wants. It can't be anything good. I would guess that's what Ben's trying to tell me. He probably wants an heir to the throne. He's going to ask me to marry someone. You seem to have inside information. You didn't come for quite some time, so I came looking for you. You to marry? Yes, that would be my intent. And as your father and king, if you won't do it willingly, then I will order you to. Not much of a king, even less my father. You may feel that way now, but you'll think differently when your head is being chopped off for disobeying me. How glad I am that you left me out in the woods. You have no idea how to treat a child, let alone your own. That may be true. But that's why I have you. You're going to give me an heir and raise him up for me. I have a father's right to give you to any man who wants to marry you. And as your sovereign, I demand that you fulfill your duty to give me an heir. I won't marry. No man can get close to me. You're telling me. I wouldn't want to get close to you, no matter what. Fine. Take some time to think about it. You'll change your mind. You'll change your mind, or you'll spend your last days hanging from a tree, waiting to starve to death out here in the woods. <laughs> How original. Is that the only way you can think of to get rid of me? After 16 years, do you think you have to come up with something better? Especially since it worked so well the first time. Well, I guess I don't need the goddess to bring me bad news after all. It comes of its own volition. Atalanta? Who are you? One who can help you, and who has helped you before. You're talking in riddles. You must be another goddess. I am. Did Artemis send you? Because if she did, you can tell her that I have no need for more bad news. I don't care if she sends it by messenger or if she comes herself. It's all the same to me. I'm pretty much fed up with all of you Olympians coming down and playing with my life. I am not a toy. I am not a pop for gods or kings to move about as they wish. I will do what I want to do. If bad things happen, they'll happen without me having been told about them happening in advance. And if you have any thoughts of giving me a bit of prophecy or divine wisdom, you could skip it. Okay? I do have something to tell you, and I don't think you will be upset as upset by it as you think you will. No! Go away! No more! I will go. Aphrodite moves away from Atalanta. As she does, lights go down on the girl, but remain on the goddess. She is joined on stage by the other gods, Pan, Artemis, and the Good Hunter. Well, you tried. I told you she wouldn't listen. Besides, you have no business telling her what, what you gonna... refuse to tell her. She has to know, Artemis, you have her living in fear that she'll kill every man she ever meets. And she will! Not forever! If you're going to share someone's destiny with them, you should give them the whole picture. She's a good girl. She deserves to know that the whole thing is only temporary. But how long is temporary? The fate said that from her 16th birthday onward, she'll be a curse to all men she, she'll meet and grow close to. We've all seen that part. Sure, she'll be set free from the curse when... You know. When she meets one 
who judges by the fruits of his heart. What on earth does that mean? Well, if you don't know, I'm sure I don't. Anyway, she wants us to leave her alone. She's on her own now. For now, anyway. So are we done here then? Because I've got to go frolic in this one beautiful garden that I saw just a little bit ago. Oh my God. Go, Pan. Have your fun. You're no help here anyway. Thanks. Bye. We should all go. None of us are any help. None of us are of any help here. Well, everyone else might be giving up on her, but I'm not. She's still going to need some help, especially since she has no idea that this curse isn't forever. The lights shift, shift up on Atalanta's area. King Iasus enters, accompanied by his messenger, who is now in the attire of an executioner. I have decided that you have had enough time. I won't listen to excuses. You will get married and have a son. Or you will die. Think fast Give me your answer. Fast. Give me your answer right now. Or you will die. Think fast and run fast. Speak, girl. What is your decision? Think fast and run fast. All right. I'll, I'll do it on my turn. We'll make it a contest, a race. I get a man that I deem worthy. One who will be fun. A big race. That's great. All your suitors get together, and the one who wins gets your hand. No. To compete, and I would end up married to a pauper or a villain of your throne. A person who wants to rule in your state, who then try to have your crown. You wouldn't want that, would you? I suppose not. So, how would you propose to raise the stakes? One on one races against me. <laughs> Ridiculous. What kind of challenge is that? I mean, you'll have to marry the first person who walks up. If he's that fast, then so be it. But that's not the entire thing. You see, each suitor will have to race me. And if they win, then they'll get my hand. But if they lose, they lose their head. That will raise the stakes. A race for the love of their life. And a race for love or their life. You're right. That would raise the stakes. That way, only someone willing to lose his life would dare come out. A man of such metal would certainly be a strong father, would certainly father a strong heir. It, it's brilliant. Thank you. Messenger! Go. Spread the word across the land. Atalanta of Arcadia is to be given to the man who can beat her in a foot race. But beware that those who lose the race forfeit their lives. I knew you'd come around. I'm going back. We won't hold dinner for you. Don't be late. No man in his right mind will risk his life to marry me. Even if he's sure he can beat me, he probably won't do it. If a man is foolish enough to show up for the race, he'll balk when he sees the execution of Zax waiting for him. I'm safe. Scaring the men away is far better than seeing them die because of me. Even if it is death that I use to scare them, it's a good solution. I thought fast, goddess. If you can hear me, no. That I thought fast. Let us both hope that I won't have to run fast. 
End of scene. Act 2, scene 4, The Race Course. Two weeks later, the log tree is prone along the back of the stage. It is split apart, and from its remains a new young tree is sprouted. The stage is mostly bare, with one section roped off with racing flags. There's a throne within the roped off area. Pan is perched on a log next to the sapling. Well, would you look at that? From a dying kingdom arises hope for new life. The dwindling power of Iasis will be rekindled and reborn into a new air. And so the rotting carcass of the fallen tree creates new fertile ground for the new growth. Men are funny beasts. There's no telling what price they will put on a thing. Like, for instance, this cost me a buck fifty at a sale the other day. Who would have thought? <laughs> Some people won't spend a dime for anything. Others will give fortunes for a stuffed toy on the internet. So what is the price of love? A life. Risk your life for the chance at love from a beautiful woman. The price seems a little steep, but who knows? Clearly, a lot of fellas are willing to pay that price or at least risk it. They say the chances of winning the lottery are worse than the chances of being struck by lightning. My guess would be that the chance of any man beating out Atlanta in a foot race would be about halfway in between the two. It's possible, but I wouldn't expect to see it happen on the stage tonight. But remember that we are in the wild and you cannot discount the unexpected. See, you were expecting me to shout something about the duckies again or something. Too predictable. The wild doesn't work that way. So I guess the only way to find out what's going to happen to Atalanta is to watch the races and see how they play out. Now, with that in mind, I suppose we should get onto the whole race day setup, just so you know what's going on. Well, as you'll remember, Way back when, when she was a babe, Atalanta was blessed by the goddess Aphrodite with the gift of beauty, more than was given to any other mortal ever. That literally translates into the fact that Atalanta was the most beautiful woman to have ever lived. This fact was seldom missed by other mortals, especially the men. The king's messenger, being a man, had noticed this and made mention of the aforementioned beauty when he was telling people across the country about the whole race. Well, oddly enough, the men just sort of ignored the whole death part <laughs> and the announcement was packed with their bags and they headed for the kingdom of Arcadia. Men came by the hundreds. Many just came to see how beautiful this woman was. None of the men who came were disappointed by her beauty. However, the number was uh, far smaller for the number of men who were willing to lose their life for a chance to marry Atalanta. So, in theory, her idea for the race did work as a deterrent to some degree. But there were still about 20 or so guys who were willing to try to beat Atalanta. And that wasn't exactly what she had in mind. But she'd made a bargain with Iasis, and she was not the one to break her word. The races would go on. But at what price? Pan exits, playing his pipe. As he goes, the court of Arcadia enters. King Iasus takes his place on the throne. Melion stands by him, though outside the ropes. Atalanta stands to the side of the throne. The executioner slash messenger is also present, brandishing a shiny axe. Clumps of others stand around, awaiting the races. All right, Atalanta, as I said, I want you to meet Melanion. Rather not meet any of the contestants prior to the race, if you don't mind. He is not a contestant. He is the man I have chosen to act as judge in this and any subsequent races. He is honest above reproach. His reputation is spotless. He should be fair. You'll be able to tell when a woman beats a man as clearly as the other way around? I imagine so. To win is merely to be the first to cross the line. 
it is, does not matter to me that the winner is a man or a woman. Do you know the purpose of the race and the cost to the losers? I do. I am a fair judge always, Princess Atalanta. Please don't call me princess. If that is what you wish. It is. Will you walk with me? No. No matter your intentions in going on that walk, it will be read by the others as an attempt to sway my judgment one way or another. And I have no desire to lose the respect of all who are here. Hmm. All right. I am pleased with you, Melodian. I am glad that a man of your integrity is to judge this most miserable of days. May the weight it will place on your shoulders be lightened by the fact that you are fair and just. Thank you, Adelanta. You didn't call me princess. You didn't want me to. Thank you, Melodian. Suter One emerges from the crowd, and he wears running shoes, shorts, tank top, and a blue headband. As he steps forward, King Iasus stands to address the masses. People of Arcadia, this man has come forth to race against Princess Atalanta for the privilege of being her husband. If he wins, he gets her hand in marriage. If he loses, his head will roll. They will run to the post at the top of the far hill and then back again. Runners, are you ready? Get set, go. Suter One takes off running. He makes his way quickly off stage. Atalanta watches him go and then starts after him. <laughs> He's not even trying. She just stood there gawking at the boy as he took off. The boy is almost to the post. Adelana is standing on him. He's on his way back, and she's right on his tail. She's past him, and they aren't even halfway back. She's pulling away. It's not even close. Here she comes. Adelanta comes jogging back onto the stage. After a while, Suter One comes stumbling out, out of breath. Atalanta? This man has lost the race. Will you have him put to death? I will not make that decision. It's already been made. Millennium, tell us who won the race. You did, Atlanta. And according to the rules, what happens to the man who races me and is not victorious? He shall meet with the executioner's axe. Sounds like the Executioner has a duty to uphold. So be it. Take him away. The Messenger, Executioner, drags Suter One off stage. After a moment or two of blubbering and pleading, the thunk of the axe coming down is heard, followed by the reaction of the crowd. Please, let that be the last one. This isn't what you want? Not at all. I didn't think anyone would risk their life to marry me. I am cursed when it comes to men. I'm nothing but trouble to them, so I tried to scare them away. I tried to make it impossible to have me. That one tried, but hopefully his death will keep others from trying. I don't want any more to die. The goal which is made unattainable becomes all the more tempting, Atalanta. By placing such important stakes on this race, you dared men to take a chance. And some men cannot turn down a race, a dare. That doesn't make sense. No, but much that we do does not make sense when looked at with scrutiny. I suppose you're right. I hope it isn't too painful. I suppose there's no way to really know. Pan walks by carrying a large sign above his head that reads number two as if he's at a boxing match. Suter 2 steps forward. He looks identical to Suter 1, with the exception that his headband is red. You 
looks familiar. You, sir, you are to run for the right to marry my daughter. Do you understand what will befall you if you lose? I, I do now. And you still choose to run? I do. Well then, runners, are you ready? Get set. Go. Both Atalanta and Suter 2 take off running at the same time. They run off the same way that the first race went. This is tremendous. Look at how many people are here for these races. This must be bringing in all sorts of money to the kingdom. Now I thought as your daughter was running a race for her life. It's the man's life who is on the line, not my daughter. Oh, I'm willing to bet almost anything that she doesn't feel that way. Willing to bet? Are you willing to bet your life? That doesn't seem the best joke for this moment. It seems to be taking longer this time. Wait, they stopped running. They're talking. What's going on? He's running again. She's just watching him go. Now she's running. She's closing. She passed him. She's coming in. Atalanta arrives running a little harder than the first race, but not out of breath by any means. He'll be here in a minute. Why did you stop? Later. Suter 2 walks on. He keeps walking directly to the executioner. He indicates that he is ready, and then he walks off. The executioner follows. After a moment, the axe falls, and the crowd reacts. Why did you stop? What were you talking about? I offered him a vial of poison. I gave him the chance to take it rather than to lose his head. He had a sense of honor, though. He was a truly noble man. Not a very fast man, but a noble one. Um, your majesty, the contestants are refusing to come forward when their numbers and names are called. What? No one is coming forward to race Atalanta, sire. No one believes that they can be. I will say something. Hear me. All you who came to marry my daughter, the next man who races will not only get my daughter's hand when he wins, but also half of my kingdom upon their wedding day. For a long moment, nothing happens. Crickets chirp. Then slowly, Suter Three makes his way shakily to the front. He is obviously frightened. He looks identical to the first two suitors, except he has a yellow headband. The grief, they all look alike. Son, I can tell you want to win my daughter's hat. Are you aware of the penalty if you lose? Yes, sir. And are you ready to race? Uh... Well? Uh... Speak up, boy! Are you ready to race? I think I've changed my mind. <laughs> Everyone watches as Suter 3 runs off crying. While their backs are turned, Aphrodite walks in and shouts, Race! They do. Everyone strikes a pose, except for Melanian. Aphrodite walks to his side. You've been waiting for me, Melania. Aphrodite. Yes. But I did not speak my wishes aloud. Lovers seldom do. I have to monitor more than just their words to know their true wishes. <laughs> but my wish is unattainable. It seems that way, doesn't it? But the right man will win. He'll win the race and her heart. These are for you. Apples? Golden apples. Okay, but what am I supposed to do with them? Put them in your bag. Pull one out and throw it whenever you need a little help in the race. And that will help me win the race. It will help. I must be a fool. For I am going to try it. 
Uh, oops, sorry, almost forgot. Clap off. There we go. Good luck. King Isis, if no other shall step forward to rage, I'll do it. Millennium, you must be nuts. Well, maybe I am, but I think I've been falling in love with Atalanta and I believe I can win. If you race, then who will judge? Neither race has really needed a judge this far. I think it will be fine. Wait, Melania, you, you can't do this. Yes, I can. You know what will happen when you lose. I can't let you do that. You're a good man, Melania. You don't deserve to die. I don't intend to die. I intend to win. Even if you did win, you will be doomed to death. That's the curse I have on me. My men will die and die horribly. But I will die horribly. Even if I do not race, for I am already yours, Atlanta. For a wise judge, you speak like a fool. Probably. I am a fool right now. Please, let's race so that I can be your fool forever. You know the rules better than anyone, Melania, and I will not ask you if you do. Know that the offer still stands that if you win this race, you'll get her hand and half the kingdom too. You'll have to start the race, sire. It wouldn't be fair to me for me to do it as a contestant. So be it. Runners, are you ready? Get set. Go. This race is run entirely on stage in slow motion. As Melanian and at Atalanta run, the king's court and any others back away and off the stage. The post that marks the halfway point is pushed onto the stage. The two of them run side by side. They talk as they run. Why did you do this, Melanian? I've grown to like you. I don't want to see you die. We won't. We'll grow old together. Atalanta? We are experiencing technical difficulties and will return shortly. Why did you do this, Valerian? I've grown to like you. I don't want to see you die. You won't. We'll grow old together. No, that is not my fate. Are you sure? Do you really know your own fate? I do. Well, do you know mine? No. 
Well, if it is my fate to die today, I can't change that. If it isn't, then I will die a very happy man. I see. The post is approaching. Halfway. You are fast, Valerian. But I will leave you behind after the midway point. We'll see. They reach the post, touch it, and run the other way. Atalanta takes the lead. Melian takes out an apple and tosses it. Atalanta is distracted by the fruit and chases after it. Melanian takes the lead. What's this? An apple? What, why is this here? It's made of solid gold. I, I'd have seen it if it were here before. It's amazing. I feel like I'm being pulled into it. It's wild. Wait, I'm falling behind. I, I must catch him. Atalanta runs behind Melanian for a while. She struggles to put the apple in her bag. She then catches up. I'm surprised you fell behind. Are you okay? You're not cramping up, are you? No, I'm fine. I'm sorry that I could beat you, Villanian. I simply can't marry. If I could, you would make a good, honest husband. And so I shall. I'm sorry. Atalanta once again surges ahead. And again, Melanian pulls out an apple and throws it. Atalanta runs after it again. Another apple? Another gold? Not what in the name of... These weren't here before. Someone is putting them out along the course or, or throwing them. Millennium! What? You're throwing these, aren't you? Throwing what? Apples. That would be very odd. I'm not sure it would do me any good to throw apples. Clearly, it isn't doing you any good since I keep catching up. True, but more importantly, you keep falling behind. Uh, wait, stop! What? Is this where you offer me poison so I don't have to have my head cut off? Yes. Listen, I don't want to die right now. I want my, I want my chance to have you as my wife, to be your husband, to have a partner in life that I respect and can love until the day I do die. That's all I've ever wanted to, but it can't be. Not, not now. Sure I can. Cross the finish line with me, hand in hand. Then, I don't win. You only have to marry me if you really want to. Not because the king has ordered it. And also, I don't lose. So I won't be put to death. If we tie, we both can have what we want. I don't think so. You're forgetting the curse on me. No, I'm not. I'll take my chances. Then you'll take them in the race, too. I like my chances. Both Melanian and Atlanta run off stage. While they are off, the court, king, etc. all come back on to their places from before the race. Pan, Aphrodite, and Artemis are there as well. This is the finish line. Atalanta comes out of the wings in the lead. Melanian is close on her heels. He throws the last apple. Not another apple! Melania chases, picks it up, and watches Melanian. Now, Atalanta! Now! Atalanta takes Melanian's hand, and they cross the finish line together. They embrace. <laughs> you, you risked everything for me. You did too. I this is my life. You risked your heart. Atalanta and Melanian kiss. They are swept off stage by the crowd. Only Pan, Aphrodite, and Artemis are left on stage. Oh, that was so sweet! Be quiet, goat boy! Ugh, I'm so angry! How could she run off with a man? And where did those apples come from? I don't know, I've been wondering about that myself. Lanian enters. He is carrying the apples. He walks up to Aphrodite and presents the apples to her. I just wanted to return these to you. Thank you for your help. What? Well, bye. Melanian exits. Aphrodite slowly turns to face Artemis. Artemis prepares to strangle Aphrodite. Pan attempts to defuse the situation. You. You gave him those things. Who? Me? Why, hi, Ara. <laughs> Freeze! 
We'll just let them work that out for a minute. <laughs> for now, let's just say that everything works out fine. The curse was broken and everybody lives happily ever after. Well, almost everyone. You better run, Aphrodite! End of play. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the talk bag. <laughs> Chris, that was so awesome. Wow. Barring our technical difficulties, I think it went really well. <laughs> I loved How hearing it. For you? I loved hearing it. It was uh, well, good to see those brought to life. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I feel like, you know, I shouldn't toot my own horn, but those, those, uh, actors were cast perfectly. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit, and we talked about this on the podcast, of course, but um, will you talk a little bit about why you chose this story and what what meaning it has for you? Yeah, um, I chose it because I was looking through a, a book of princess stories that my that my daughter had uh, when she was itty bitty. Um, and this one struck me as having a lot of potential for uh, a, a woman making her own choices despite fate being against her. So fighting against what fate had planned for her as it were. And, uh, and of course, the, the idea of fate in and of itself is uh, something that basically says you don't have control over your own life. Right. It makes you feel powerless and to stand up against it, to have a plan for it, to have thought of something clever, the race uh, structure in of itself to thwart uh, the fate, the fates um, was something that I liked. I like the idea of being able to uh, say, you know what, I do have some control. Um, you don't have control over everything, but you have control over some parts of your life in ways right. that are very important. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a strong female character, or at least potentially is, and uh, it has a, a lot of potential in that way. Well, how did you feel about having the, some of the genders of the, of the cast reversed and did that, did that change anything for you in, in the way that it felt, I know you wrote this play like 18 years ago. So yeah. Um, there, there, yeah, there are a number of things about the script itself that I would change already, not having to do with the gender of the actors. Um, but one of the things that I noticed was that um, some of the essentially critiques of uh, male masculine behavior um, tend to come off differently when it's played uh, not traditionally male. And yeah. I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that thought yet. I have to process it. 
Um, so we'll that's see. so interesting. I, you know, I had the same kind of thought and I was thinking like how it would be so interesting to maybe remove, except for the moments when, you know, when it's really necessary, like uh, Millie Yeager and Adelanta, their interaction has to have that dynamic of like, oh, how could you be, how could you think of yourself as as important as a man? Like that that interaction has to stand. But there are other things that could that could just either be genderless or or you know even re- reverse the gender or whatever. I think yeah, I thought that was so interesting. There's so many moments that so much that we that we took for granted 18 years ago <laughs> as like gendered interaction. Yeah, that absolutely. now we don't need to anymore. Yeah, yeah, so interesting. Um, it, it's it is interesting in that. Um, some of the things that I was at the time trying to put out there was uh, the toxicity um, right. of um, male behavior in certain situations. And having those lines coming out uh, by uh, someone who wasn't male presenting um, made it made me go, oh, well, now that's someone else being toxic. And I'm not quite sure that's the same thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it lends levels that I hadn't imagined. And as I've said before, my my uh, my plays grow when they are in other people's hands. It's why I don't direct my own plays generally. Um, so yeah, That's smart. I think <laughs> that's so amazing. I I'm curious to to see what watching it for the second time makes me feel like, you know, um, or, or even the third or fourth time, I'll probably watch this many times, (laughs) start to make decisions, um, as a director. (laughs) Um, what else, uh, what was there, were there other moments that you noticed? I, something I hadn't noticed just from reading the script Mm -hmm. was that fantastic joke that you made at the end about the running gag. I did not, put that together until until you know Dryden was the the suitor three times and I was like oh my gosh it's literally a running gag it, it is. <laughs> in a running gag <laughs> Which is sort of, genius that's genius <laughs> well thanks I'll take that but at the same time um yes it's also a dad joke essentially um I love dad jokes <laughs> yeah. um one of the things that I I was thinking about was the first draft of this many, many years ago involved uh, moldings of that guy's head bouncing back across stage each time with the various headband on it. Um, and and the, that's, that is entirely the reason that it is the same guy. Um, but I, I, as you were, re- as it was being read today, I was like, oh yeah, I got rid of that. Good. Okay. That's, that's a less morbid thing, but at the same time, the joke still remains. So. Well, um, and it still really works. Like it's so yeah. funny. I mean, it's, it's yep. so funny. Um, yeah. I, I enjoy a number of the, the jokes and I really enjoy the puppets. The puppets make me happy. They always do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so um, the, the, <laughs> Some of the stuff is a, a little clunky, but I already knew that. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. now hearing it out loud, I'm going, okay, that needs to be tweaked. And it did actually bring out the part that I was looking for more than anything, What's is that? what things would be better as song. What would be, mm-hmm. uh, we can get rid of this whole chunk, you know, and replace it with uh, a song that says the same thing much more eloquently, much more quickly. and you know um yeah so there were a number of things like that uh that what um what can you give me any examples of moments that you noticed that would lend themselves well to song as soon as i grab my script yes <laughs> <laughs> I put okay. it down right there right. um give me a second yeah absolutely what happens to my background when i walk away oh it stays okay cool yeah it stays <laughs> i saw your chair for like five seconds and then Neat. Um, <laughs> so uh, something that I marked early on um, 
Let's see if I can find it. It is the uh, Artemis basically saying she doesn't know how to be a mother. Um, oh, that, yeah. That monologue where she's discussing yeah! the difficulties, her fears, her, her insecurities, but also her hopes and dreams for her child. This, I mean, that seems to be ripe for a, uh, a, a song. Um, the, I mean, I would, I would even go so far as to say were an operetta or an opera, I would go for an aria there as opposed to, you yeah. know, some lighter piece. Um, Cause it is, it's serious. It's that's the doubt that every parent has at some point. Um, yeah. You know, uh, similarly, I, I think there are some fun times when uh, banter between two people. I think the the, the verbal sparring of uh, Atalanta and Melly Egger could be a, a, a back and forth duet of sorts. Um, That'd be cool. And, and I, I'm really interested in hearing what the other folks, the, the ones who are reading it, think of that. Well, I mean, they should one, be coming back any yeah, minute yeah. now. They'll be able to tell us. Absolutely. Me too. I'm so curious to see what they think. One of the things that I have always, not always, when I was writing it, it didn't occur to me, but uh, after the first reading many years ago, um, which the play has changed since then, but... Uh, one of the things that I have been confronting is that it's technically two separate stories. The first right. act and the second act are, are, are two tales. And my question is, uh, are they both needed? Um, can one just be related uh, as opposed to, do we tell both of them? Um, which is stronger? Or can one be truncated and support the other? Or I don't know, I, I just, you know things I'm kicking around idea wise I think one of the things that I want to definitely look at changing is just how much agency uh Atalanta has in the decision the decision to run across the final line uh with Melanian is obviously the most important decision you know for them to tie essentially yeah. um but uh I think those first two apples can be her figuring it out fast, faster and possibly going, oh, I get it. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, I like this guy, maybe I'll decide to go after the apple instead of being uh, especially a cat or a raccoon and chasing after the shiny object. Yeah. You know, um, which is technically the, the myth. But again, as we discussed uh, last, uh, on, on the uh, on the podcast was that I don't uh, I don't have to feel tied to the uh, what's it called source material um, as much because the source material has been told and retold many many times by for many different people um, so I I stuck more. I don't want to say religiously, but let's because I can't get another word. I stuck more religiously to the uh, to the original books that I used as references um, than I think I need to give my permission myself permission to deviate from. Sure. Yeah. I love I love that. Yeah, let's we can talk more about that in depth <laughs> maybe sometime this week. Sure. Uh, I have some ideas. But I wanted to welcome the cast back. Hey guys, come on in, feel free to unmute and, uh, and join us in our conversation. Chris was just asking uh, or talking about being curious about those moments that we could potentially turn into, into songs. Did, it, did any of those present themselves readily and easily to you? Feel free to speak up. Uh, right after Atalanta meets um... Artemis and she charges her with that. That's like a classic MT, something's changed and I'm going forward, got to do something different moment. Yeah, good call. That would go just really, really great ballad really? Or a moving piece. 
really any time that there were those lengthy dialogues, I mean, especially Atalanta in Act Two, I mean, that's just like begging for a ballad and especially also uh, Millennium and Atalanta, the slow motion running scene, that's a duet. Like that's a duet right there. <laughs> And yeah, I, yeah. I, think, I oh, sorry. I'm, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I felt that that scene where Artemis is realizing that she can't do both. She can't be a full time mother to uh, at Atlanta and fulfill her duties. And I, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself personally. But as a woman who has had to choose between having children and my career and life responsibilities, that was a really heavy moment. And the fact that she's okay with it and that she accepts it and embraces it as the right decision for her was so empowering to her as a character, but also to me as an audience member. Yeah. And so I think that that is a brilliant moment and there is a powerhouse song there for sure <laughs> i think that um Plexippus and his brother had a pretty goofy dynamic so i think that they could yeah. have had a, a really silly song that i can like already hear the um reprise when they die <laughs> <laughs> So that's a good point, though. If we're talking about reprises and stuff, like all the expository stuff that Pan does, you, that could be a theme that just continues and returns and just throughout all the acts. And that would be a really easy way to like speed up the. <laughs> oh, that that makes me think. I was going to say, like as a joke in the beginning, what is it when King Easus comes in? His whole "woe is me" thing. If it, it's not, it's whole song is some some big operatic. Wagnerian thing that's just ridiculous and as soon as it's over but then the idea you just brought up is that then when you get to the good hunter in his thing talking about how much he loves her and how great he is the same music but done mm -hmm. with love as opposed to over the top you know, uh, great idea because they're both fathers you know in a way they're mm -hmm. father figures and it's first one's about him the next one's about his daughter that sounds super brilliant and deep and artistic and stuff, but really I just want a Goofy Fates puppet trio. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, that needs to be a song. And like a patter song, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was gonna say, should it be like the Anderson sisters or like, <laughs> you know? Yes, like... and we need an <laughs> Anderson sisters patter song. Yes, Love honestly, it. the puppet. Honestly, the puppet scene is my favorite part of the whole show. I think it's hilarious, <laughs> and there's just unbelievable potential in it. So, yeah, you could just do a whole show of the puppets. I'm a it little disappointed so in myself. I'd planned. I have a, my dog has my dogs have voices, and I'd planned to use one of my dog's voices, but somehow it came out British instead, and I just had to pivot and go with it. Let's but go with you it. guys all went British. It was so fun. It was <laughs> like I was like, oh, okay, this is the thing. It was great. Love and this. of course, the um the the boar hunt would be a comic ballet. Oh, that would uh, be a miracle! I really want you, the king, the evil king, to have a really great song and dance. Nineteen thirties, nineteen forties, like Vegas number, with big over the top. Like, I I really want you to have this great song and dance evil number. I don't know why. I just really like that idea. Yeah, I I could see it like right before the race, and then it goes through stages as he loses, yeah. and he comes up with an mm -hmm. idea. Then the race is happening, and it's yeah. I, I, oh, I could see interesting. That. Yeah, the like villain that. always needs a song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like the idea of um of the. I mean, maybe it's all one, but uh, I really like the what was already thrown out of the um, Artemis song of <laughs> letting her go, but also the um, the two hunters on the other side being like being like interject like being a part of that as well, like interjecting and it like going back and forth, that it being like almost two different beats or something like that. I don't know. Oh, you mean like what Artemis is going through her? her like big moments kind of yeah thing, maybe or... or even like the yeah and then and then go give it to them and they're kind of wailing like artemis why like to have even being a part of that song i think would be really interesting too like and it, it going back and forth cool. i like that would be fun i think to the banter between um malika and atalanta especially when they're getting to know each other would be a really fun kind of saucy duet oh yeah yeah this is the dumbest idea but i just think it'd be funny to Can't see wait. um 
Artemis start singing a song as the bear, like, this is my bear song. <laughs> and Pan be like, uh uh, we got to cut this shit out. Like, no, we're not going in that direction. <laughs> It might work. Uh, the, it awesome. might even work the other way because I feel like Artemis is so often the one that's like, no, <laughs> like the <laughs> Pan starts singing the bear song about her, and just like, no, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, something else Chris and I were talking about was how gendered the show is, right? And um, we were looking to kind of expand that experience to be more inclusive um but then there are these moments that are really about uh, women's empowerment and so how do we find that creative balance between you know having Adelina stand up for herself in this patriarchal structure as well as you know finding moments where we can be non-gender specific and and you know, more inclusive. I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts on, on that. I really think having the gods gender bent makes so much sense. Like, and I didn't, I didn't feel like there were any roadblocks in there. Like as far as like hearing, hearing stuff, like, uh, like I thought Pan and Aphrodite were like perfectly, perfectly cast. And I, and I never had this moment in which I was like, oh that doesn't make sense because of their gender do you know what I mean I think I think I kind of overheard that earlier and I think that that maybe makes more sense with the mortals although I think everyone was wonderfully cast um I think that some of those places might be more with the mortals and, and less with the with the immortal I think that's sorry I got some barking over here go ahead continue yeah go, go ahead, ahead Kelsey no you first Okay, cool. Uh, my question too, then, is also like just in how thinking about uh, Mel Yeager, like how mask presenting is this person uh, as far as like expression? You know, is someone's like, like, is there fake facial hair? Is there, you know what I mean? What are all these kind of objects of masculinity that is in alignment with this very like masculine person? And to me, what's fun is just thinking about that energy and thinking about what that physicality is particularly and like how much we would really want to lean into that um that's always kind of my question and when it comes to gender it's just like what is the you know how, how much are we playing with that I I was gonna say that I think in the first act at least and Chris I heard you as I was logging on say that the two stories are sort of their own the first act and the second act can sort of live separately do they both need to be involved that sort of question um I think, I think with the gendered thing, there's just, in the first act, there's so much gendered language, so much about her being a woman. We don't care about a woman. We can't trust a woman. Men are blah. Like just there's, there was a lot of it. And I wonder if maybe some of that could be more about she's young, she's inexperienced. We don't even know where she freaking came from, you know, all of those kinds of things. Or if it has to be just the like male, female um, opposition in that act. Mm -hmm. And then if, it, if we're talking about the second act, there's a lot more opportunity for it to just be suitors of any type. Um, but I guess the, the, you would have to kind of mess with the fate of that one to make that sort of stand. So I, yeah, it's coming from the, the whole like very gendered source material. So I understand that that's a, a hard yeah. battle to, to fight. It, it was that. It's also the fact that originally I was taking on uh, male to masculine to toxicity. Um, so 18 years ago and even today, um, you know, it, we're still in the same society that we were then. The artistic <laughs> crowd may feel differently about that, but the rest of the population doesn't. You know, um, and, and when it comes down to it, challenging that is still something that I want to do, if that makes sense. So I'm wondering if the first half may go directly to challenging male maths, or maybe it is the the mortals versus the gods. Uh, the gods, more godly is uh, non-binary. Uh, humans are not approaching that yet in the tale, you know, something, or as they become more advanced, they get towards that. Um, but yeah, I mean, Meliager is supposed to be the, as written, is supposed to be the epitome of 
male toxicity. Um, you know, um, because when it comes down to it, that's still who controls things. Um, so I don't know. Gotcha. That, that was the initial. It was awesome. Yeah. There was also a lot of pull and push about power. And it wasn't just about like who was in charge. It was who was telling the story with the gods. So I feel like you can really, you could play with that power structure, like not only just with between the gods and the mortals, where as they become more non-binary and they become more accepting, they leave behind, you know, the restraints of gender on the earthly realm but they still are fighting among themselves. Like, I feel like that story can kind of link the two together as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just thinking, does that make sense? I'm, I'm yeah. just thinking in terms of um, female empowerment, um, she goes through most of the first half uh, protected by the gods, all the magic. And then, you know, Zeus has the thing, when you go out of here, you will no, no longer have that protection that doesn't really seem to come into it. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that could be a moment for her to say, I don't want the gods to protect me. I will protect myself. I'll take it on myself. You know, that could be a moment because there, you, you do have those two halves that don't, as far as I can see, don't really come into play. And that would be an opportunity. Now, that, as a strange aside, the thing that's missing is what happens in between these two tales. And that is that she actually is the one woman that goes on uh the argos uh with uh jason she's one of the argonauts um she is one of the epic heroes that goes on that journey for the golden fleece um and that is not that doesn't take place here she gets because she kills the caledonian boar she gets to go on that adventure and then she comes back and does a race after that um, so is this like a three play series instead of I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know so much as anyone ever goes to, out of their way to attend three plays all by in an arc anymore, but um maybe. <laughs> I um, mean, once we turn it into a movie series, you know, whatever. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's pretty popular still. Everybody still goes for eight hours and listens to Wagner. So I mean we can well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can get away with it. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to open up in these last 12 minutes to see if you all had any questions for Christopher after you listened to each other and got to experience the whole play or for each other, if you have any questions about choices that you made as actors or, you know, anything like that, please feel free. Just because I, I have to leave in just a few minutes, I did want to ask you, Chris, specifically about Atalanta. It was uh, something that was like a good challenge for me was trying to find the balance between, I mean, this is, it's it's a funny show. Like it is, there's, there's very serious moments, but overall, like it is lighthearted and it's funny. And there were moments that Dryden, um, you're making me laugh a lot. So and I kind of had to not look at you, um, because, especially during the suitor scene. I was like, I, I can't, I can't look at him. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I think it's finding, especially when I read through the script for the first time, I kind of felt like Atalanta was sort of the anchor in the show. Like she was someone who was very honest the entire time. Like she wasn't really, but there are those moments for comedy with her in it. So I just wanted to get kind of your overall perspective and take on that. Yeah. Um, she's the one that has to go on a journey of some sort mm -hmm. uh, as the main character. But um, with that in mind, I think one of the things uh, when I was writing it, Pan is me. Um, and so part of the problem is uh, not turning Pan into the main character. Um, and uh, Pan is the main character at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, as I'm watching it, Pan needs to be backed out more so that Atalanta can be more of the main character and have a variety of interactions as opposed to just being the, I guess, plot line with, uh, with legs. Um, yes. You know, it's, uh, and, and so, yeah, that, that's the main thing I was watching today. I was like, no, well, it's, it's Atalanta. It's a story of Atalanta, but it's still Pan's story. And that it is 
less so than when I first wrote it, but it is still true. So I still have more to go to make Atalanta a fully fleshed three-dimensional person. If that for makes sure. sense. For sure. Well, on that note, I do have to hop off, but this was such an honor to get to Great create to. with you guys today. I can't wait to see where this goes. Chris, thank you for letting me do this. This was so much fun. Absolutely. I love all you thank guys. You. Bye. Have a good rehearsal, Sarah. (laughs) Thank you. Ah, bye. Does anyone else have any other questions or? Uh, Yes, I was just curious as to what drew you to this specific story. Like, why did you decide to tell the story of Atalanta when there's just so much to pull from Greek mythology? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Because (laughs) it's seldom told is the first one. Ah. Um, I mean, how many times am I going to need to tell the story of Perseus yet again? Or, uh, I mean, I could have told Medusa's tale from Medusa's side or something, I guess, but, you know, the, they're ones that are generally well-established and people already have opinions as to where they are. Um, Atalanta is not so removed from uh, public knowledge that they don't know what it is, but if you mention the, the apples thing, there are a couple of golden apples myths out there and they often get conflated. Um, so telling, telling the one uh, that had the fight against fate and potentially the fight against sexism basically uh, what was appealing to me. Um, they, I was reading a, stor- a storybook that had I think eight princess stories in it and it was all eight uh, princess stories for young girls that were not the princess stories that you're going to normally get from the disney world. Hmm. Um, and this was one of them. Oh, and um, it figured to be the, well, honestly, the easiest to do uh, and the most potentially understandable. Hmm. I mean, without having to delve deeply into teaching people about another society. Mm -hmm. There was a a great Vietnamese one in the book. There was a great Colombian one in the book, but both of those are not straight down American society. And when you can take, uh, what's it called? Um, Greek myth has been so, I don't know. Pervasive? Uh, yeah, well, let's go with pervasive. I, I was going to say homogenized. I don't know, just, you know, uh, basically wrung out and watered down uh, that we can make it fit whichever society we drop it into. Um, okay. And so it was easier without having to make cultural references to just drop it in and go, okay, middle America, here's what I'm trying to say. Hmm. Kind of thing. Now that may seem weird since I, my career has been entirely translating from other cultures into English uh, <laughs> so that we can learn from other people. Um, but dot, 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 in a children's play, I figured this might be real easy, um, which is kind of a cop out for why I did it, but yeah. <laughs> cool. We have time for one more question. I have a question uh is is zeus like traditionally in the storytelling of atalanta like a guy that is like the good hunter that that helps her because i was like wow zeus is really nice in this story and normally mm-hmm. zeus is a piece of shit in most mm-hmm. things. So i'm just curious <laughs> like where where, where that's, that, that's fair it was only in one version of the story that i read yeah, um the good hunter is in a couple of the stories and he's not zeus uh in one of them the other one he is and i'm not entirely sure why they decided that i mean sometimes she's just raised by a bear um and so you know and sometimes she runs with uh artemis's uh maidens the vestal virgins as one of them until she suddenly decides not to be it it's it becomes part of that thing where it has been told so many times by so many people in so many different ways that it it just gave me a reason to put a, a, a father, father figure in there. I wrote it as a single father, um, a, a, as the primary caregiver to my daughter. And so I wanted to get the, the, the single father in there somehow. At the same time, 
his first few Bad. pages, I'm like, oh, those are terrible. Let's rewrite those. Um, <laughs> and then eventually my wife was sitting in the background and you can't see her right now, uh, said something to the effect of, well, then there he finally sounds like a dad. I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right. But, you know, um, that, that was entirely selfish, really, when it comes down to it. I put it in there for my own edification. <laughs> Um, well, I, that kind of leads me to ask this question because some of you are playing multiple characters at the same time. And I know we are really short on time, but I was just curious to see how it felt to play multiple characters, get to like do a little bit of, you know, one, one, one guy who's maybe like a jerk and one guy who's like kind of nice or smart or, you know, like opposites or whatever. I, do you have any thoughts? I'll say for me, it just, they, my, my two roles, they seemed meant to contrast and be opposite. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. just leaning into that, in a sense, I mean, if I were playing just one and not the other, I probably wouldn't have gone as far. Mm -hmm. But because playing both, I wanted to really do it. And just to add on to the last thing, I was thinking that about Zeus too, is that I, I ended up looking for where is he ever a jerk? And I only found the one place when he like snaps at hand. But otherwise, I kept looking. It'd be interesting maybe to have the good father and yet still have his jerky aspects in there, too. Because my yeah. understanding, mythologically speaking, he's good and bad. I mean, he's got both. So, but, but, but I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Anybody else want to say anything about it? Teresa, you're on mute, honey. <laughs> oh, okay. is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Now? Okay. Uh, for me, as the understudy, uh, just watching all of you, uh, it was just amazing to see how you made that transition uh, from the the complete opposite, right? Uh, especially, oh, I'm going to say the name wrong, but Mel Melieger and then Melon Melonian were played by the same person. And that was just incredible to see, like this is who he should have been the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just a really, really interesting contrast for me as an audience member. So I really enjoyed that a lot. And well done to all of you for making it so obvious. <laughs> yeah, Kelsey, you brought a lot of depth to those characters. Nice work. Thank you. Nice work, all of you, honestly. <laughs> that was so fun. Um, well. I want to express my gratitude to you all again for your hard work and your beautiful reading today. You truly are the perfect people to read these roles. So thank you so much. Um, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I look forward to hopefully working with you again in the future. <laughs> um, Kevin, did you have anything you wanted to say before we head out? Or are you okay? Awesome, guys. Look for an email from me tomorrow. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>